Okay, we're ready. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, this docket number 2021-0024 status conference. I'm Jay Griffin and chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. I'm joined here today virtually uh, by Commissioner Jennifer Potter. Uh, you can see online here, Commissioner Leo Suntian, as well as our commission staff, consumer advocate, and actually, I don't see him online here yet, but Scott Glenn, excuse me. Oh, I see Scott on here now. Scott Glenn from the State Energy Office joining us as well. So uh, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Purpose of today's status conference is to address Hawaii Electric's plans in anticipation of the retirement of the Kahului Power Plant on Maui. Uh, as well, actually, we're going to receive updates from uh, Scott and the Governor's Task Force, as well as uh, updates from Clearway. Energy Group and Hawaiian Electric. And so before we begin, I want to briefly discuss the format for our status conference. Commission is hosting this through WebEx for the DACA parties, but is live streaming status conference for the public and stakeholders via the YouTube link provided on the Commission's website. With this link, the public and stakeholders will be able to view the status conference, but will not be able to provide comments during the status conference. Commission's recording the status conference and the recording will continue to be available on Commission's YouTube channel. Uh, just as a reminder, while you may not be able to uh, post comments in on this, you can always submit comments to the commission to be posted in the docket record. So just uh, so folks are aware, information of that on that is available on our website. And so thanks for that. For the status conference agenda, uh, we'll begin with the update from Hawaiian Electric and Clearway on the commercial operations related discussions re regarding the Mililani One and Wyava Solar Projects, followed by an update from Scott Glenn, the Hawaii State Energy Office on the Governor's Power and Pass Coal Task Force. And then we'll move on to the on to Hawaiian Electric's presentation uh, on the Kahului Power Plant Retirement Plan and the Commission's questions uh, that were filed in the docket yesterday uh, that were submitted last week. Uh, with each of these, we'll, we'll have questions from the Consumer Advocate, Commission staff, and Commissioners. Um, and so with no further ado, we will Turn it over to Hawaiian Electric and Clearway uh, to provide a update uh, for the parties here on the status of your discussion. So I'm not sure who uh, intends to go first, but we'll I'll turn it over uh, to the relevant folks here. Chair, Chair Griffin, um, commissioners, uh, and and uh, consumer advocate, and and all staff. Um, just thank you. My name is Scott Sue, President and CEO of Hawaiian Electric Company. Um, Really, for this first section, I'm going to hand it over to Duke Oishi, as well as uh, Nicola Park, uh, to provide the updates on the status of the Clearway uh, and Hawaiian Electric discussions. And then later on, after um, Scott Glenn does his presentation, um, I'll, I'll rejoin. But I also just wanted to um, make reference that, you know, one of the things that that the entire Hawaiian Electric team that's on the WebEx today, uh, we want to make sure that we are providing as much information as we possibly can and just express our our support so i'll i'll be uh, uh, providing comments later on but for now let me hand it over to duke and nicola thank you thanks scott uh could you greg are you sharing screens could you move to the next slide please and duke if you can speak up a little bit louder um it's a little bit soft okay got it we'll do good afternoon chair Griffin, Commissioners Potter and Asuncio, and I'm Duke Oishi, in-house counsel for the Hawaiian Electric Companies. We also want to echo uh, Scott's thanks to the Commission for this opportunity for Hawaiian Electric and Clearway to provide an update on its PPA amendment discussions. Joining me today from the Clearway team is Nicola Park, uh, who's the origination manager from Clearway. As noted in the April 5th filing by the parties, Clearway is currently working with its suppliers, contractors, lenders, and other counterparties to determine whether accelerating the schedule for its two projects will be feasible and to assess the associated costs and risks. In parallel, and as also noted in our April 5th filing, the parties are currently focusing their efforts on actions necessary to close the project's construction financing, which is Clearway's critical short-term priority to ensure success of the projects. Hawaiian Electric is involved in several aspects of this financing and is currently putting forth significant time and resources towards this effort. For example, we've spent a good portion of last week and this weekend reviewing and discussing financing consent and estoppels, which are necessary for Clearway's financing. 
please note that we really do understand the urgency. Hawaiian Electric stands ready to continue expedited PPA amendment discussions once Clearway is able to gather information necessary to provide the company with specific proposals on schedule and pricing. Also wanted to note that Hawaiian Electric has already agreed to all operational items which require action by Hawaiian Electric and were proposed by Clearway in its March 25th filing with the commission, such as committing to work with Clearway on exp expediting the project commissioning process. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Clearway team to provide an update. Thanks, Duke. Uh, aloha, and thank you, Chair Griffin, Commissioners Potter and Asuncion. Uh, as Duke said, I'm Nicola Park, the Origination Manager with Clearway Energy Group. I am the local developer here in Hawaii for our utility scale solar portfolio, uh, supported by a world-class team at Clearway. Uh, I'm joined today by Julia Zuckerman, who's also on the line, Clearway's Head of External Affairs for the West region. Uh, first, I just wanna thank the commission for this opportunity uh, to provide an update on our efforts to accelerate our projects, guaranteed commercial operations dates um, by the proposed three months. So our projects are the Nililani 1 and the Waiava solar projects. Uh, which combined represent 75 megawatts of PV and 300 megawatt hours of battery storage uh, that we are working to bring online next year. Uh, so as Duke referred to, we submitted a joint filing to the commission last Monday, uh, which summarizes the current status of our negotiations uh, on the proposed amendments. Uh, and in line with that filing, we would definitely like to assure the commission that Clearway is working closely and collaboratively with Hawaiian Electric as our partner to get these projects across the finish line, as Duke said, both in terms of financing the projects, as well as on the negotiations of the acceleration amendments. Uh, and we are certainly working to do that is in as timely a manner as possible. Um, I think it's important to note that a lot of the key people that are involved, um, both on our team and the Hawaiian Electric team that are required to negotiate and execute these amendments are the same people that are supporting us on uh, closing financing at this time. Um, so as Duke uh, clarified, some of those documents include consents and estoppels, uh, i.e. production review reports uh, that are supporting uh, and are critical for our lenders and tax equity to close financing. Um, so we really need those limited resources focused on that near-term real-time effort at this point. Um, so that's really the best thing that we can do to ensure that these projects stay on track. Uh, as we also said in our filing, we're working really closely with our vendors, our suppliers, our contractors, uh, such as our EPC uh, and battery integration partners to determine how feasible this acceleration is in practice. So sort of taking those uh, conceptual discussions that we've been having and taking that forward to the contractual amendments that are required uh, with those parties. And so once we finalize that process and our financing, we will be able to uh, sort of finalize the price and schedule milestone details that make up the meat of the PPI amendments. Uh, as Duke also mentioned, we've had uh, several collaborative discussions on commissioning and CSAT process improvements. Um, I think we're making good headway there and our accelerated schedules do rely on capturing improvements um, during commissioning. Uh, so we have several more working sessions coming up to nail down those uh, procedural and commissioning improvements. Uh, importantly, we'd like to um, flag that we do plan to uh, notify the commission as soon as we close financing, and then we would plan to file the amendments as soon as practical uh, thereafter. And then, you know, also I uh, wanted to clarify that if at any point we determine, you know, prior to that June 30th date that the acceleration is not going to be possible uh, for one or the other of the projects um, or both of the projects, we will certainly let the commission know um, promptly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in closing, we will um, accelerate these negotiations to the greatest extent possible, and we're really highly motivated to do so um, as we continue to expend increasing amounts of development capital on these projects. So we look forward to providing the commission updates soon. In that regard, um, we're also highly motivated to execute these amendments as soon as possible to reduce the risk associated with such an acceleration. So just wanted to flag that as well. So with that, um, thank you and uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Duke and Nicola. I think I'll turn to Dean Ashina in your office first, if you have questions for either party here. Uh, 
Oops, sorry. Um, all right. I, we don't have any questions for now, um, but I, I guess depending on how the rest of the presentation go, we, we may have questions at a later point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll turn to commission staff. Uh, we've got Dave Parsons from our Office of Policy and Research, Carolina Sheeta, Chief Counsel. Maybe uh, Dave, do you have any questions here? Uh, just one question. Uh, wondering if you can provide any more specifics about the timeline that you're working on for um, closing the financing and um, you know subsequent. It's on subsequently. Um, you know, working on the PPA amendments. Sure, yeah, I can provide a little bit more color on that um, related to the June 30th amendment date that we included in our filing. Um, we sort of collaboratively, I guess, arrived at that date uh, based on the current realities of the project timeline. Um, but roughly assuming that we are able to close financing by early May, we are looking to execute those amendments as soon as practical thereafter, but we believe will require at least four weeks to turn red lines um, of the amendments with final details, um, a week or two of internal approvals, so both Clearway and Hawaiian Electric internal approvals. Um, in parallel, to some extent, we can pursue lender and tax equity consents that are required uh, with final commercial terms. And then um, there is some time that's required sort of in parallel um, for preparing the regulatory filing. There also is roughly a week, uh, I, I would say by four weeks in there for negotiations with downstream suppliers and contractors. Um, so really we rely on those commitments and those contracts being amended in order to amend our commitments under the PPI, just to simplify that. Um, so that includes some timeline for amending those contracts. So we we certainly hope to execute sooner if possible, but given the many factors, moving visas, a lot of parties involved, um, that's how we arrived at that time frame. Oh, okay, thanks. And then the other question I had was related to the, um, uh, there's reference in, in your comments um, uh, the March 25th comments to the independent engineers um, NEP estimate, uh, the net energy potential estimate. Um, mm -hmm. Has that been um, has that been completed that that report, and is that something that um, you can share, you know, with the commission? Yeah, the report has been completed, um, but I would say not finalized or in a format to share with the commission at this time. So there is a mechanism under the PPI where that needs to be accepted and approved by Hanoi and Electric, um, and then also confirmed by lenders um, and financing parties that that is the final IE report that's being used for, for financing. Okay. I don't know if um, Hawaiian Electric uh, wants to make any other comments on that point, but. No, Nicola, I think we're, we're, we're pretty close to I think we've informally said that we're we're okay with the report, but um, whenever you folks are okay with sharing it with the commission, I think that's that's determinative. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. That uh, chair, that's all the questions that I have for now. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Caroline. I don't have any Caroline. questions right now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, I'll turn to Commissioner Sunstein. Uh, no questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Leo. Uh, Commissioner Potter. No questions for me. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, everyone. I just have a couple of questions, and I think it'll be fairly brief. But first, I want to remark, um, just since our first status conference last March, I think this is one of the positive events that's transpired. Actually, there's two. One, seeing in the news the groundbreaking event. Um, so congratulations to Hawaii Electric and Clearway. Um, these are ceremonies, but always important milestones. So that's good to see the progress happening. But also that you came forward with a proposal um, answering the call. So we thank you for that. Um, but I, just to get a little more into the details, you know, what I, if I'm understanding correctly, you know, there's really it's a timing challenge here. Uh, we we totally understand the the need, importance to the financing, uh, 
closing the financing on this transaction. That's really the foundation of the projects. That is why the commission offered the clarifications uh, that Clearway requested. Um, but so we understand that that needs to happen. Uh, but right now it looks like things are working sequentially. Um, so what I guess what I want to ask Clearway and Hawaiian Electric, is there a possibility? How can we work in parallel? So make sure that the financing is complete, but are there elements of the um, amended PPA discussions that can be tackled in parallel? Uh, so, you know, what I heard were there's a lot of combined resources, but I guess since we have most of the relevant decision makers online, is there a possibility here, um, or at least starting the discussion, how to move in parallel? Because just to start from, you know, we understand the uh, request was to, or the, in the written proposal is to submit, possibly submit these amendments to the commission on June 30. Um, but, you know, from our standpoint, there's going to, there, there will need to be further you know, regulatory process to review. We're going to work, I think, expeditiously, but um, I think the theme here is trying to move timelines to the left. And so I want to see what can be done between Hawaiian Electric and Clearway to work on this in parallel and to understand what, what's possible there. So um, I guess maybe I'll ask Scott first and then Nicola to comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, we will be doing whatever we can to move in parallel. So any part of the PPA amendment that can be negotiated, even in as uh, Clearway works through their closing process, that's what we're very interested in doing and supporting that. Um, the other thing is when it comes to finalizing any of the regulatory submittals, the uh, PUC application itself, uh, that's where we certainly can uh, do as much as we can to fill in all the all the blanks as much as possible and uh, you know, hopefully shave some time off of uh, the uh, application prep as well. So um, our, our teams are, are well poised to you know, do that and uh, you know, try and shave off even days, uh, which can add up to a week, uh, which hopefully can add up to a couple of weeks perhaps. So we'll, we'll be looking for those opportunities. Nicole, I think you're on mute, but yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I would just echo uh, what, what Scott said there in terms of doing everything that we can in parallel to the extent possible. Um, as I mentioned before, I guess I just wanted to also thank the commission for moving quickly uh, and responding to our request for clarification on points that supported our financing. Um, that was helpful uh, for regulatory opinions that are provided to our financing parties. So I just wanted to flag that and say thank you. Um, Regarding the regulatory approval process, I just wanted to comment on that um, because we're certainly aware that that you know, typically takes some time and that these commercial changes will require PUC approval um, and that if we can expedite that process, um, that would certainly be helpful. Um, I might just hand it over to Julia Zuckerman on our team. Um, Julia, if you want to speak to um, some of the thoughts that we had about the regulatory process. Sure, um, and thank you again to the commissioners um, and Chair Griffin for, for having us here. Um, so as we think about the, um, you know, the timeline from here to actually um, getting the acceleration underway, um, we, we do anticipate that, and I, I appreciate you flagging this, Chair Griffin, that in addition to ex just as we're accelerating this process of working through the PPA amendments, we are also hoping to see an expedited timeline to get through the regulatory approval. So what we anticipate will happen is that when we submit the PPA amendment or when we execute the PPA amendment, it will have in it a threshold date for regulatory approval because we would need that approval before moving forward with things like, you know, major contract amendments and purchases and things like that. Um, our hope as we try to sort of plan backward from that point is that the, you know, if the original timeline for approval of the PPAs was about three months, where our hope is that since all the commission would be considering at this point was the amendment, that that could be done in about half the time, which would be about six weeks. So, you know, certainly don't need to, to prompt that whole discussion now, but I, I did want to um, put that out there. That, that That is part of our plan as we figure out 
you know, what the schedule looks like from our side. Um, part of the regulatory process also is that as we indicated in our, our um, joint filing with Hawaiian Electric, we do expect that depending on what information is required from us, the files, some of it may need to be filed under protective order. And so we're hoping that that, um, you know, we want to make sure that that's expected as part of the process so that that doesn't also create delays. Um, but we appreciate, you know, we appreciate the commission's commitment to helping get all of this done as quickly as possible and, and you know, hoping to work collaboratively with, with you all as well. Uh, just responding on the spot, I'm going to tap my chief counsel. I believe the protective order is in place for both dockets already. Is that accurate? That's accurate, yes. Um, but okay, I, well, sorry, was that, I didn't want to cut you off. Is that everything, Julia? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, that, I don't have any other questions. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the heads up on the threshold date. I was worried you were going to say something like 24 hours. Um, so, well, six weeks gives us something to plan around. Um, obviously, we have to see what comes in. Uh, but, you know, uh, urgency has been the, the key word here. And just for those trying to tie back from our uh, staff conference last last month. Um, if you look at these two projects, plus you know what's expected to come online from or currently scheduled to come online from AES West Oahu, it does give a, criti a critical mass of projects uh, prior to the AES project uh, plan going offline. If you look at AES uh, HNEI's reliability analysis, this kind of puts us over the minimum threshold bar. So it's a uh, critical. Uh, uh, the proposal you put bef uh, put before us, we appreciate it, um, and I think we appreciate everyone's working together to see how the details can be worked out, and we'll proceed from there. So I don't have any other questions, and so thanks for everyone's participation so far. I think Dean did say you may reserve questions for later, so maybe um, some of you folks could hang on the line. Uh, but I think with that, uh, it's a Pretty good segue into moving uh, into the discussion update from Scott Glenn and the state energy office on governor's power and pass coal task force and how that effort is going to help us manage project schedules collectively for the whole set of projects here. So, Scott, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Aloha, Chair Griffin and commissioners. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak about the task force today. Um, I have a few points, uh, no presentation though, so no screen sharing. Um, <clears throat> first off, just um, to note that governor did uh, initiate the task force. He signed an executive order. It's executive order 2021-01. The name of the task force for everyone is the Powering Past Coal Task Force, uh, which is in alignment with an international agreement that he signed on to the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which is meant to focus on moving forward Asked the question of fossil fuel and coal use and uh, playing on the uh, double meaning of powering past, right, to get past this and to do it with renewable energy, which is, um, I think, an important commitment that uh, Hawaii is also demonstrating and leading within the country on for uh, taking a coal plant off online and not replacing it with combined cycle gas or some type of other uh, fossil fuel source. Um, this executive order, he signed it on March 30th, two weeks to the day from the status conference. Um, for uh, for governor in terms of signing this executive order within you know two weeks was meant to demonstrate the seriousness that the state government is taking of this issue and that uh, being able to pull together the resources to have an executive order ready signed and executed in two weeks is is a big lift for state government and so that I think is something to show on our side about our commitment. Um, Along with that, the energy office to help give some background on this in executive order has created a web page at our website, energy.hawaii.gov slash PPCTF, which stands for Powering Past Coal Task Force. On there, you can find links that refer to the different whereas statements in the executive order to help explain how we, how we came to this and the basis of the executive order actions. 
Um, the executive order itself is really focused on um, invoking the statutory authority of the energy office to work with agencies, the private sector, and others to facilitate and align um, efforts for project deployment. And so this is um, this is a power the chief energy officer has, and with the governor's executive order, um, it basically creates a situation where the state agencies involved can come together and work together in terms of schedule alignment um, and understanding what the overall uh, picture is and all the moving pieces. Um, but what it also does not do, and the executive order is clear to do, is that it's not a decision-making body. And so the Powering Past Coal Task Force is meant to help uh, create awareness among the different moving pieces and look for those opportunities to save days, to save weeks, and ideally save months and understand who's up to bat next uh, without uh, stepping into the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission or any other state agency that might be involved and have their own independent decision making to make. Um, so that's that's an important element of this task force. The task force had its first meeting on March 31st, so the day after the executive order was signed. And the in introducing it, um, the task force looked at creating a master schedule that the energy office would maintain. We currently are in the midst of constructing that uh, master schedule by getting input from Hawaiian Electric, Clearway, and others on both what it would, how to structure the information, as well as the level of detail that would be appropriate. And I think at this point, if folks have looked at the filing by Hawaiian Electric on the Maui projects, um, you'll see in there a project, some different line items of steps and dates. And that's kind of the rough uh, approach that we're looking at for the master schedule of the Oahu projects. Um, not exactly necessarily that way, but that's the general idea of where it's headed. And uh, maybe one distinguishing mark is in that filing, it shows it by quarter, and we would probably track things by week because we we really are trying to save days and weeks here. And we want to make sure we can we can vis visualize that and visualize those savings. Um, you know, again, just to just to also say what projects we are tracking are eight projects that do have an approved PPA from the PUC. So it's not all renewable energy projects on Oahu, but the ones that have been expressly identified by the PUC as being co connected to the retirement of the coal plant. And as uh, commissioners, you move forward through this docket and others and identify other resources that become part of the critical path of this effort, then the task force is authorized by the governor to then take up those matters as well for coordination and alignment of schedules. So we will we will watch you all and how you proceed through the various dockets and identify other solutions that are part of this. And we'll continue to monitor, monitor that for inclusion in the task force. Um, I think that uh, pretty much concludes all the points I wanted to make about the task force. And um, you know, it will it will at this point look to be meeting probably monthly toward the end of the month to just check in with everyone and understand where are the gains that have been made, what are common lessons learned, and and if there are any major changes or new additions to these projects that we're tracking. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, chair or commissioners if you have any questions. Scott, I'll just add uh, commentary first for any questions and you know, the this effort's had the full support of the commission from the beginning. Um, we recognize the value on the need for these, the public sector agencies to work together with the private sector here. And along that line, um, we have one of our staff, actually two, Dave Parsons is joint helping, but one of his staff is dedicated as the point person, uh, helping coordinate you know, information on permitting. You know, At least it can be collected from our dockets I know Scott's doing that. Scott Glenn's doing that with his staff. Scott Sue's doing that with his staff. So I think um, that this is one of the encouraging signs here. Um, but we're, you know, we've dedicated our resources to help too. Uh, just those that are watching, if you have uh, questions, you know, that need to be called from these uh, dockets in support of your permitting applications, um, please, please talk to Dave. It'll be um, a staff member working on that. But we 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 have. You know, dedicated some of our staff to supporting this, uh, and I know Scott has too, as well as bringing consulting re resources. So, 
um, it is a all hands on trying to help uh, move the projects through the process here. Uh, so that was the commentary. And so now any questions, I just, again, we'll turn to Dean for, and Dean's a member, we have lots of other state agencies, so kind of multiple hats here, but so any questions for Scott? Uh, we don't have any questions for the state energy office. Thank you. Okay, thanks Dean. Uh, Carolina or Dave? Okay, Leo and Jenny. None for me. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think just uh, we'll ex we'll um, plan to have this as a regular agenda item as we hold these status conferences. I know Scott and I have talked about that. So um, thanks, Scott. Hopefully you'll plan to stick around, but I don't think we'll have any more questions for you. But appreciate it. Um, appreciate the leadership of the office too. So. Um, Thank you. And so with this, we'll move into the part of the agenda, um, our primary focus today, which is the plans on the Tahului plant retirement. Uh, but first, before we start with that, I know I want to turn it over to our chief counsel briefly. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, really quickly, before, I just first wanted to uh, say that we appreciated the revised initial status update redactions that Hawaiian Electric filed on April 5th. Um, however, uh, regarding the IR responses that Hawaiian Electric filed in docket number 2018-0436 yesterday, uh, where it states that um, Hawaiian Electric didn't have sufficient time to get permission from the developer to make public the information that is covered by the existing non-disclosure agreement, we're asking that as soon as you're able to uh, discuss further with AES that you file any updated redo redactions in the docket as soon as possible and hopefully within the next week, just because it'll make it easier to sort of review that information and, and make it more publicly available. Um, and then regarding the other redactions in the 2018-0436 IR responses, we're reviewing those now and we'll issue an order if we have any questions or concerns regarding those redactions. Thank you. Okay, thanks Caroline. Unfortunately, I'm gonna follow up again here. And unfortunately, re history is repeating itself. Uh, so if I can have Scott, please. So last month we started, you know, we had a big problem with all the red lines from the first filing, sorry, or all the redactions we've got here. So it took multiple times to get that correct. Last week we asked you, we asked Hawaiian Electric for, just so it's clear here, what we've asked for are communications between Hawaiian Electric, Maui Electric and AES on the two year project delay, internal communications on that within Hawaiian Electric. And what we got was very limited response, lots of redactions. I think whole appendix was redacted with the email communications and then claims of deliberative privilege um, instead of sharing information. And so when we started this docket, one of the key themes is transparency about these processes. Um, and again, it's this is like round two. Um, so again, our chief counsel and her staff are gonna have to review what was filed. Um, it's gonna take their time. And then we're gonna have to see what should have been or should not have been redacted. And so what I asked last time was that we get it right the first time. And again, uh, we have to spend our, have our staff determine that. It's not, it's not a good use of our time. Um, and that's not the environment that we want to foster here. So I'll leave it at that. Is there any other comment of that? We, I thought it was clear last time. Chair Griffin, I think, I think you folks made it very clear last time. Um, right off the bat, let me just acknowledge that. So um, we are continuing to try and work with, uh, with AES and, and others to make sure that what we are able to provide unredacted is, 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 um, I mean, we, we want to lean forward definitely. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does require us to have some time and dialogue with, with our developer partners. So, um, but let me, let me just acknowledge right off the bat. Yes, we, I, I think it was loud and clear what you folks communicated in the past. Okay. But to say again, Carolina and staff are going to have to keep spending time on reviewing this, and that is not the best use of their time. Um, so, but 
Well, sure, we're going to start on this note, uh, but let's continue forward and we'll go into the uh, presentation that you guys have prepared. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. So um, I'm just going to have a, a cover of the opening slides, just a few opening introductory remarks, and then I'll hand it over to Colton Ching uh, for the majority of the uh, presentation. Colton and I will be doing tag team and then as specific questions may come up, um, we'll tap any of our um, other other Hawaiian Electric colleagues uh, who are also on the WebEx. So, um, if I can go to the next, we can go to the next slide first. So, this is these are the the high level topics that we plan to cover in our briefing today. Um, really, just wanted to provide the overall um, uh, from from end to end what we're trying to achieve. Uh, working through the specifics of the transition plan, um, what we're trying to do to accelerate the renewal projects, and then, of course, getting into the contingency plans. And then finally, um, we wanted to share some information to address some questions about more near-term reliability reserve margins. So that's our overall um, agenda. One of the things that we're also mindful of is that as we walk through these different slides and provide the information, um, this will, it, it's intended that we are uh, able to provide the information that was also requested in the commission's information, information request, the IRs, um, which we uh, filed yesterday. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so right off the bat, um, we thought that it would be helpful just to bring it to the overall high level objectives of what we're trying to achieve here. We are trying to move as quickly as we can to phase out the Kahului power plant uh, fossil fuel operations. So that is a driving force behind why we're here today, right? Um, as we will share a um, little bit different context to the Maui resource plan and the retirement of Kahului power plant compared to the AES plant on Oahu, um, whereas on, on Oahu, the AES plant has an expiring PPA at the end of uh, September of next year. Um, Kahului power plant is really driven by, well, the desire to get off of, of the fossil fuel and our current permits for the plant um, um, expire in 2025. Um, as we'll talk about, um, there is some flexibility there too, but overall, we want to retire that, that power plant as soon as we can. Um, maintaining reliability, of course, is a, uh, a, a critical issue in terms of running the system as we make the transition to our renewable projects um, and make other system improvements. Just maintaining that reliability of service to our customers is, is a key, key consideration. Uh, and then finally, we, finally, the acceleration of those renewable energy projects, not just to help us with the reliability uh, transition, but also to advance forward on renewable portfolio standard achievement, as well as, of course, uh, to the extent these are, are very good, attractive projects in terms of pricing, um, it, it benefits our customers be, to be able to accelerate those projects. So I wanted to start there because where we will tend to get into in the next uh, several slides is getting down into the details, down into the nuts and bolts. Um, but I wanted to just impress upon everybody that these objectives are very, very important. Um, these objectives are objectives that the commission itself was driving us on, uh, including for Oahu. Um, so we just wanted to acknowledge that these are ultimately what we want to achieve. So uh, let me pause there um, before I hand it over to Colton. Any, um, any questions? And I, again, just wanted to impress that you know, from the perspective of, you know, our entire company, uh, chair, as you mentioned, participation in the governor's power powering pass coal task force. This is an all hands on deck um, uh, initiative for the for the company. So that's why you see um, so many of our executives participating on this call today. That's why you also see us supported by so many of our our key staff here. So we certainly get the importance and urgency of achieving these objectives. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I think we'll we'll save the questions till the end, though. But appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Colton. Let me hand it to you. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. 
Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to start off my portion of the presentation by uh, talking about the current status of Kalui Power Plant, or what you'll see in these slides, we call it KPP. Uh, although we do have current plans to retire uh, KPP in 2024, uh, the, with the four generating units there, we do plan on reduced operations to begin before the retirement date. Uh, also, as Scott uh, has noted, that the current permits that we have for the plant, uh, although we do plan to retire in 2024, uh, the permits that we have in hand today allows us to operate uh, the generating station until the end of 2025. So if we encounter contingency situations, we do have that flexibility, not that that's what we want to do, nor what's in our plan. Uh, currently, right now, Kauli provides a fairly small amount of the total energy consumed in Maui. So although the four generators there total about 36 megawatts uh, of capacity, it provides only 14% uh, of the energy uh, consumed on Maui on an on a annual basis. Uh, but uh, KPP does provide essential reactive power. Um, some folks will call it VARs. Uh, voltage support, uh, inertia to the system, frequency spot response, uh, grid forming capability, uh, and because of its location, uh, provides relief uh, to various parts of the transmission system uh, because it's the only generating station located within Maui's 23 kV system, uh, which encompasses the Wailuku and Kahului area. Next slide. So given that, that unique function and set of roles that Kali Power Plant provides, um, there are several functions or services that need to be replaced before KPP can be fully retired. All four generating units can be retired. Uh, so first, for replacement capacity, we're looking to get that replacement capacity from a combination of demand response and grid services from distributed energy resources as well as capacity from solar plus storage and storage systems that are part of the stage one and stage two uh, procurements. The second, because again, because of its location, we need to provide replacement voltage control within the 23 kV system. Right now, it's the, only, the, the station is the only source of voltage control and our plans to continue to provide adequate voltage control within the 23 kV system will be through the conversion of just the electrical generator portion, not the, not the combustion portion or the steam portion of the Kalui 3 and 4 units, but the generator itself to convert at fairly low cost, convert that generator into something that's called a synchronous condenser, which uh, can absorb and produce reactive power to the system without having to actually produce megawatts of energy or without having to consume any fuel uh, there at Kali Power Plant. The third um, function or service is to uh, replace the transmission um, supporting function by putting a source of generation near a good portion of Maui's load. Uh, and the solution for addressing that transmission congestion that results from not having a uh, Kauai power plant is through the a building of a switch yard at Waena that's able to take uh, existing transmission lines and segment it out uh, so that it can address uh, transmission congestions during contingency situations. Uh, and then lastly, that grid forming capability, right? Creating that nice AC waveform that clean power that our equipment needs, uh, that, that we use, that needs, will come from the grid forming requirements that we have for inverters in all of the uh, stage two projects for Maui, where those inverters will have the specific capability to create the proper waveform for the system, rather than to just follow the waveform that it sees on the grid. Next slide, please. So kind of taking those concepts and putting it in a diagram, this is a diagram that was in uh, our filing uh, on the 12th. 
It shows a timeline of the different uh, resources uh, and components that I spoke to. Uh, right uh, in this diagram, we show um, the different timing of the stage one and stage two resources. You can see Pahiahu, Pulehu, Kamaole, and Waena. Um, these are the 20, early 2023 resources. And then you can see Kuehilani and uh, Kahana, which are coming in in the later half of 2023. Uh, you also see in here the additions of load reduction uh, or capacity that comes from the uh, two parts of our grid services uh, purchases, GSPA 1 and 2 shown here. Uh, and then as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can see here on the bottom, the Wayana switchyard, which addresses the transmission requirement. Uh, and at the very right side on the bottom, uh, we show here in a red arrow where we begin the uh, permanent retirement of Kaolui units. And in particular, because we're repurposing components of Kaolui 3 and Kaolui 4, converting them into synchronous condensers, you see that red line at the end of 2023 where we plan to take uh, Kaolui 3 out of service to begin this conversion into a synchronous condenser. Uh, which is shown in the uh, kind of grayish arrow in 2024. Uh, we will then follow that up with the conversion of Kali 4. In the meantime, uh, Kali 1 and 2, uh, we don't expect the unit, these two units to um, operate on a regular basis, but they'll remain offline. They'll be available to operate to provide uh, voltage services and other services that might be needed during this period. Uh, but so really that red line there shown at the end of 2023 is sort of the beginning of a process to sequentially take uh, each of the four generating units uh, offline uh, for retirement. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, prior to when units will be retired, uh, those units uh, won't necessarily be run the same way they have been for the last several years, right? We'll sequentially be reducing its operations, but having them available should something unexpected happen. As we get or bring onto the system, the capacity, the transmission, uh, congestion solutions, and the voltage control capability. So it's more of a transition rather than a sort of black and white overnight change. Great, can we move on to the next slide? So next, I wanna spend a few moments talking through some of the uh, steps that we're taking to accelerate uh, renewables and transition away from the use of Kali power plant. Uh, so I kind of broken them down to the major categories of projects. Uh, for the stage one projects, uh, you know, the IRS work for those projects uh, that are sort of in the critical path where the project design and interconnection design um, are, are complete. And some of those projects, additional IRS work uh, is taking place in order to accommodate requested changes in equipment that, that uh, developers have requested, uh, but is not affecting the critical path and schedule for the identification and ultimately the design and construction of interconnecting facilities. And I'll speak a little bit more to that uh, in some later slides. Uh, we For stage one projects, uh, we are awaiting approval for line extensions, but uh, notwithstanding that, we're, we are committed to reducing the Hawaiian Electric review time for developer drawings. There are multiple uh, cycles of drawing reviews, and so we've committed to reducing the maximum amount of time that we take in each of those um, iterations. Um, to reduce and aggregate our total review time maximum from 100 uh, to, to, I'm sorry, from 120 days down to 100, uh, shaving almost a month off of the, that process. Uh, and then again, that's the maximum, right? We'll strive to do it within less, in less days than, than what the maximum requires. And we've been uh, pretty good about, about beating those times. Uh, we also committed to, and Duke kind of touched upon it a little bit when we were talking specifically about Clearway, but more broadly for the stage one projects, you know, we are committed to reducing uh, our role in steps towards acceptance testing and the various commissioning steps. 
uh, we play a role along with the developer back and forth and together to make those steps happen. Uh, so we're committed to making our part of those steps happen more quickly. Uh, and one often overlooked element of a project uh, that we have um, some role in, but uh, isn't often mentioned is in uh, establishing the telecommunication infrastructure and equipment that's necessary to support a project project. So we're expediting uh, our own telecom uh, installations, both the developers and the utility have roles in installing uh, each of our respective tele telecom equipment, uh, but we're committed to expediting our parts on those as well. So that's a real brief summary for stage one projects. For stage two, uh, the things we're doing is basically everything we talked about in the state that I just talked about now for stage one. Uh, but in addition to that, um, you know, we've offered early engineering uh, for these projects um, so that engineering work to support design and ultimately equipment purchases and construction uh, can happen in parallel with other steps rather than only happening in series. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we are providing our design standards. So a lot of the design can be bypassed through a standard design rather than a custom design uh, for every project uh, as part of our early engineering work. So those are some additional things that we've we've added to stage two pro projects. Um, you know, as I mentioned uh, earlier briefly for the synchronous condenser projects that the utility uh, is proposing to do, uh, we do have some flexibility of when that conversion begins. So because it's a conversion of an existing unit, if we can bring onto the system the replacement services that allow us to take Kaului 3 out of service, say a few months before the end of 2023, not only does that accelerate uh, the shutdown of Kaului 3, but it also accelerates when we can begin the conversion uh, of of the Kaului 3 generator uh, into a synchronous condenser. And the same thing applies uh, to Kaului 4 as well. Okay. Ray, can you move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, the next three slides uh, shows a uh, sort of like a project timeline, a Gantt chart, if you will, uh, of the stage one projects, the stage two projects, as well as the utilities proposed projects. Uh, we using a similar format. We thought that a format like this would be uh, able to provide higher level information, uh, perhaps a little bit more effectively um, by showing not just the timeline, but sort of the general sequencing and the relationship in times between the major activities. Um, so for the next three slides, we'll, I'll be explaining um, some information about each of these projects. Uh, during the Q&A section, be happy to answer any specific questions you might have about these schedules. Um, first thing I wanna highlight that for, for all of these projects, you'll see in a darker blue, uh, one of the tasks for each of these projects is called Hawaiian Electric Work. And in parentheses, we'll list out in there this kind of a general description of the Hawaiian Electric Work uh, associated with each of these projects. Um, this is a lot of work all portrayed in one line item. So there's actually many, many steps in here, but for the sake of a more simplified chart uh, and schedule, we kind of bundled into one. And that's partly why it shows such a, a fairly long period of time. Uh, I will say though, for every one of these projects, the Hawaii electric work uh, is not on the critical path uh, for these developers projects. But having said that, we are still looking for opportunities to accelerate our work in this task item, uh, because even though we're not on the critical path uh, for the projects, uh, if we're able to accelerate our work, and if a developer is able to accelerate their schedule, it ensures that our work doesn't become uh, a critical path item or something that you know, sort of limits any acceleration that a developer might be able to do. Um, so that's common to through all of these projects in here. Um, so just a few highlights uh, in the interest of time on some of these projects uh, for AS Kuehelani, which is the first project in here. Uh, 
you know, we uh, are wrapping up our SIS work um, by the end of April. Um, we're doing some restudy work associated with uh, AES making some adjustments to the inverters, but that doesn't have an effect on the interconnecting facilities. The facility study for, for Kwehlani was originally completed back in April of 2020, um, but because of the redesign of the facility uh, that we mentioned previously, uh, the that work is being redone. And uh, as part of that adjustment, Hawaiian Electric is now uh, taking on the responsibility to uh, design and construct the generator tie to that facility. Uh, for Paiahu, um, there is a restudy that's in place for the battery. Uh, Paiahu is switching their design from an AC coupled to a DC coupled uh, system, but that restudy and that change is not affecting the schedule for the interconnection facilities and therefore is not affecting uh, the overall project schedule. The facility study uh, was originally completed back in May in 2020, uh, and Hawaiian Electric, um, Ma Electric subsidiary, uh, will be uh, constructing the line extension for that project. Great. Can we move on to the next? So next two uh, schedules are for stage two projects, similar format. This slide shows Pulehu and the Kahana projects. Uh, these for these projects, um, we for Pulehu, we're planning to complete our SIS work and provide a draft report to the developer um, this month. Um, the preliminary facility study was provided to Pulehu uh, back in December, and uh, the developer has completed their review. Um, we offered, and Pulehu uh, accepted uh, performing early engineering. Uh, so that's in progress and uh, biweekly meetings have begun um, starting back in February of this past year. For Kahana, um, we uh, it's a contested case proceeding. We have uh, a hearing scheduled, I believe, in September of this year. Um, the uh, system impact study um, has been recently completed. Uh, the report's being drafted um, and we plan to share that with the developer in April. Um, the facility study for the project uh, was issued to the project developer back in December uh, and is under review um, currently as we speak. Um, we did offer early engineering uh, for this project, uh, but uh, to date we're still waiting uh, to hear back from Energex on that. At this point, I think they feel that it might be a little premature to, to begin that early engineering work. Okay. Next slide, Greg. Okay, so last uh, last slide on this. Uh, last project, uh, IPP project, is Kamaole. Uh, the par purchase agreement for this project was filed in February of this year. Uh, as you know, this project underwent a change in ownership, uh, so that was filed recently. Because of because of that uh, that change, the uh, IRS work has not uh, started yet. We're actually waiting uh, for the project developer to provide us uh, a model of their project so we can be begin the IRS process. Um, we, like other projects in stage two, we did offer early engineering uh, to Kamaola Solar and is currently uh, under review uh, by the developers. Uh, and then lastly, um, the Waena battery project um, the SIS, the system impact studies uh, complete. The draft report is going to be sent to the separate project bid team uh, later this month. Um, right now, at this point, we are not aware of any project delays uh, with regard to the interconnection for that facility uh, and the facility, the final facility study for that project uh, is underway right now. Okay. Um, for completeness, uh, we included a similar, uh, I'm sorry, Greg, if you can go on to the next slide. Uh, similar schedules uh, for the two utility uh, projects, not a utility bid uh, or a sell bid option, but the utility infrastructure projects. Uh, here's a schedule for the Waena switchyard 
uh, and the Cogli three and four synchronous condenser uh, conversions. And then, like I like I mentioned uh, earlier, the synchronous condenser conversion, uh, you know, can be accelerated if we're able to take Cogli three and then Cogli four offline earlier. And we are looking for opportunities to accelerate taking Cogli three and Cogli four offline uh, as we get uh, the replacement. Uh, grid functions uh, in service and, and operational before then. Okay, great. Next slide. Okay, so that's the plan, right? But as we had discussed uh, before and had some conversations on before, uh, no one can predict the future. Nothing is a guarantee. Uh, so to mitigate any unforeseen delays that may come up that we may not be aware of now, that no one can anticipate. Uh, the company uh, has committed to pursuing uh, DR grid services on top of the services and programs that we currently either have in place today or currently underway today. And so the company is proposing to work with the parties to create a grid services program for, for the island of Maui in the range of about 30 megawatts uh, with two to four hours of load reducing service is part of that. Uh, the 30 megawatts uh, is based upon sort of some rough analyses of different types of unplanned scenarios that could could take place. Uh, doesn't need to be up to the uh, full 30, but we kind of set an initial target around that and have some flexibility to adjust around that as well. Um, we think that uh, if we can stand this up quickly and procure these services quickly, not only can it serve as uh, a contingency measure for uh, potential delays or unexpected events that occur with the programs that I mentioned and the projects that I mentioned, uh, it can help us with a more near term 2021, especially 2022 uh, reserve margin numbers uh, as well. Uh, and then from a longer term perspective, right, not to just think about this as a, as a program or resource just for a few years, want to look at the long term value to assist us, assist the Maui grid for, for the longer term in terms of providing uh, reliability service to the system. In, in addition to those grid services, sorry, Greg, yes, thank you. Uh, in addition to those, to the grid services we're proposing, uh, the uh, the Hawaiian Electric is looking to evaluate, looking at and evaluating other contingency options. Uh, they're listed here. Um, you know, these are not things we would want to do, but things that we want to ensure that we explore should we find ourselves in a situation where we may, may need to do things that are unplanned or, or things that we prefer less. Uh, so one that we mentioned earlier uh, is that because we have permits in hand for a Kali power plant, for operation through 2025, you know, that's clearly one contingency, even though none of us want to operate Kali power plant um, into 2025. It, it is an option as a contingency. Uh, do want to note that the permits that we have right now expires at the end of 2025. If we find ourselves in a situation where we want a contingency uh, that uses Kali power plant beyond 2025, um, doing so will likely require uh, a switch to a cleaner fuel at Kali power plant, further perhaps, um, you know, impacting the the possibility or the attractiveness of that as a contingency operation. Uh, but but it's there. Something that we talked about a walk on Oahu that also applies to Maui is making further adjustments to our maintenance uh, outages, um, and we can make those adjustments, particularly in the 2022 and 23. 2023 timeframes that can help with uh, our reliability numbers. Uh, and then the third contingency is that we have uh, uh, sites uh, at our Kuehalani substation uh, permits in hand to site uh, temporary distributed generators there um, should, that, should we need to. So that provides another contingency option uh, that we're continuing to evaluate. But again, these are contingency measures uh, that we are evaluating, uh, not part of what we have as sort of a base plan. Okay, Greg, thank you. So um, 
this chart and the next chart has a similar format. So let me take a few moments to kind of set up uh, the format for, for everyone. Um, the x-axis here is time, in this case, running from January of 2022 uh, through the end of 2025. The left y-axis is a percentage number. This is our energy reserve margin percentage. And you see a line going straight across at 30 because 30% 30 is our energy, res energy reserve margin or reliability criteria threshold for um, for Maui. And then on the right, and so the left column, I'm sorry, the left y axis and the ERM percentage applies to the various colored lines that you see on this chart. On the right hand side is another y axis which shows megawatts. Uh, this shows uh, the amount of megawatts uh, in nameplate that are coming on board through different resources that will be added to the Maui system uh, over this time horizon. And that's that right hand y axis applies to the blue, uh, the light blue columns that you see uh, stacked behind. So, just to give you some orientation, and there's some labels associated in there. So, first to start off, um, you can see that the green line represents the energy reserve margin calculation uh, continuously throughout this period. And you can see the green line jump. Uh, from month to month because of the calculation for that period of time. And you can see the green line kind of hovers around the 30% number uh, through April of 2023. And the green line rises um, significantly up uh, at that point and then sort of hovers and has a slight decline going through the end of 2025. The green line represents the ERM calculation for the Maui system, assuming uh, all of the stage one uh, and stage two, as well as grid services uh, projects all come online as currently scheduled today. Okay. But what we also wanted to do and what, what we also show in this chart uh, are different situations, different scenarios where uh, you have, in the case of the blue line, uh, the stage one projects uh, coming online as currently scheduled and only the Wayena BES as part of stage two. Uh, and in the uh, uh, also in the other blue line, the stage one and stage two projects, both of which with grid services. And the red line, uh, which uh, actually begins all the way back in January, which is on top of the green line through April. Uh, shows what our ER, ERM or reliability will be uh, with uh, no stage one, uh, I'm sorry, with the stage one projects uh, added uh, and with the grid services that currently are planned uh, added to the system, but only stage one projects. I hope I got that right, guys. Okay, so this shows that, again, with all, all of the uh, projects that are being uh, proposed for both stage one and stage two, we remain through this period well above our reliability criteria. We do have some buffer, some margin where if not all of the projects uh, happen or if some of them do get delayed, we still have sufficient margin um, exemplified just as one scenario uh, through the blue line in here. Uh, but that if we don't have enough resources coming online, the reliability uh, reserve margin, uh, energy reserve margin uh, doesn't elevate and, and continues to hover around 30 and at times falling below that. Okay, next slide, Greg. Okay, so this chart, very similar to the one before, uh, but in this case, we're looking at the time frames uh, going back a little earlier, and it shows our energy reserve margin calculations for the Maui system um, up through April before uh, the first uh, stage one project uh, comes online. And in, in this chart, you can see that our ERM uh, at times are above the 30% energy reserve margin numbers and at times it's it's below. 
this calculation does take into account uh, the uh, the two GSPAs, right, GSP1 and GSP2, as well as the current Maui Fast DR program and their impacts, their contributions to reliability. What this chart does not show is adjustments that power supply can make to the maintenance schedule of some of their uh, generating units to address these fairly narrow periods of time where our ERM uh, falls below 30%. Um, so if you look within sort of the August period of 2021, our ERM falls in there, uh, we can, we power supply is looking at opportunities to adjust or shorten um, maintenance, especially for their CTs on Maui, because they're such a big part of their system. Uh, and because the four CTs on Maui have just completed their 50,000 hour overhaul, it puts them in a good place where they do have some flexibility to defer or adjust their, uh, their maintenance on those that can then, as a result of that, bring their, uh, the, their more units available to, to serve load, which would then increase uh, our energy reserve margin and our reliability calculations for those periods of time. Okay, so to to summarize, let me just um, just summarize a few things, and then I'll hand it back over to to Scott. Uh, you know, like like Scott does does did mention at the very beginning, uh, the company is leaning forward on this, and it's a whole company effort here. Um, you know, the company is being proactive and looking at ways to both accelerate the projects. Uh, that can aid in bringing in or accelerating the first the lowered use of KPP and and ultimately the earlier retirement of Kali power plant. Um, but we're also proactively taking steps to look at contingency actions that are prudent to uh, be prepared for should we find ourselves in an unplanned situation with project delays or, or other things that are unexpected. In order to do both of those things, uh, we want to collaborate both with project developers as well as the DER parties, because a big uh, part of part of our contingency is to develop um, some new DER programs that can provide load reduction grid services. Uh, we are definitely uh, benefiting from the governor's task force uh, focused folk right now on the island of Oahu. We want to leverage that. Uh, and take those lessons there and apply it to the island of Maui as well. In particular, uh, in working now, you know, without the benefit of the task force just yet, uh, to begin collecting information, developing master schedules, and putting useful information together so that we can work with the developers uh, and the various uh, permitting agencies, whether they're state or, or, or county, uh, to find opportunities to accelerate the important permitting steps uh, for all of these projects that we covered in here. Um, and then, you know, as, as Scott's opened us up in this meeting, you know, really this gets back into to these accelerations, this, this leaning forward is really around making sure that we can achieve uh, our shared objectives to retire Kali Power Plant and to do so on an expedited basis. Uh, but while we're doing that, we want to ensure that we're maintaining reliability before and after that transition. Uh, and as we're doing all of that, uh, find ways to accelerate the addition of renewable energy on our system, whether it's big renewable energy or, or small re renewable energy. So with that, Scott, I'll turn it back over to you uh, for any closings you might have. So I think you you covered most of the bases there, Colton. I, th I think the only thing I would add is that, you know, I've asked the entire team to think as progressively as they possibly can about these various pieces of the, of the resource plan. And that goes to, for example, you know, even though we, we have our existing processes and we're doing what we can to try and shave some time off, um, you know, really taking a fresh look at how we can even think about um, you know, the company either, uh, taking on more of the work ourselves, um, or perhaps even working something out with 
the developers, especially when you talk about the smaller projects like DER, CBRE types of projects about how we can, you know, again, the company taking more off the plate of, of the developers so that we can move those projects more expeditiously. So again, really just trying to think out of the box, um, not just interested in just tweaking our existing processes, I guess is, is my main message here. So with that, I think that's uh, that was our last slide. Great, thanks Scott and Colton. Uh, Dean, we're gonna turn to you now for uh, your questions and questions from your office. Uh, thank you. You know, if I can start, um, I, I I apologize if, if this is uh, maybe not such a great question, but with the idea that you're going to convert uh, K3 and K4 to synchronous condensers, um, my understanding was that it would still be located at the power plant. Is, is that correct? Hi, Dean. This is Colton. Yes, that is correct. So the generator would remain physically at Kalui power plant, uh, but only the generator uh, and when it's converted and the adjoining switch yard that connects the generator, now synchronous condenser to the 23 kV system will remain. So I, I have a few follow-ups to that one. Um, you know, given that the, all four of the units are relatively old, does it make a lot of sense to use K3 and K4 as, as the synchronous condensers? Bob, do you want to take that one? Sure, I can. Um, you know, so we've taken a look at um, K3 and K4 generators and done an evaluation on, you know, how much longer they'll last. We, we've done a lot of work on those over the years. In fact, we um, rewound, I think it was the K3 one just, you know, several years ago. So we feel like the generators are in pretty good shape to continue operation and and not a complete question but for how long um for you know as long as a typical project 20 30 years um now you know one i think it's the k3 condenser and we put this in the application there's some cooling fans on it that we'll replace because in our evaluation those were um you know not up to where they should be but um yeah, I, I don't see a big problem with uh, the generators uh, lasting. And, and generators tend to um, not have too much wear and tear on them. Okay. Um, and, and then sort of continuing on that, that same vein. So I, there were a couple of references to retiring the uh, Kahului power plant, but it's it's not necessarily retiring the entire facilities. It's just retiring the use of the four units as, as generating units. That's correct. It, it's retiring most of what makes up the Kahului power plant. Um, some parts will remain, such as the generators, some lube oil systems, some cooling systems, um, a, a few things like that. But you know, the, the entire boilers, you know, all the pumps and motors and everything that are associated with them, the fuel tanks, um, will all be retired. And I, I guess, have, have you guys done an assessment of the, because I, I thought this was discussed at one time, but Kahului power plant is literally uh, located right next to Kahului Harbor, right? And, you know, the, the concern with sea level rise, I mean, is, is there any concern about, you know, the continued use of, of KPP? No, no, there's not concern about that. We, we've looked at that, you know, that was something that we wanted to make sure you know, we wouldn't be making a silly move by doing that. Um, you know, sea level rise should not inundate the entire plant, but also, you know, the equipment that we're talking about um, is set back from the shoreline a bit. It's also elevated on the the second deck. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have the exact elevation of it, but uh, we think it'll be protected. Okay, um, and and maybe now it's still kind of on the theme of the condensers, but related to the timing of, of the other projects. If if any of the um, stage one, stage two projects and or Maui Electric's efforts to get grid services uh, result in um, being able to have those resources available sooner, could the conversion of KPP also be accelerated? 
because it looks yeah, so right now. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to add. Um, it it looked like it's it's sort of being timed around. Um, I, I think it was the AES and the Kahana plant where those are kind of expected to be available Q4 of 2023. But do you need to wait for AES and Kahana to be in place, or it, could it be as long as there's some? Uh, and, and pick a number, uh, 20 megawatts of, of capacity available or 30 megawatts, and then the conversion could start already. Yeah, so, you know, the current schedule, and Colton touched on this in his presentation, um, the red arrow in the in the presentation represents when we would start. We can move that up. Um, you know, that we, we had to put a time on the schedule. We were being a little conservative to take into account any kind of uh, delays there might be in other projects as well as you know wanting a little bit of time for any of those projects to operate and make sure they got all the bugs worked out um but yes you know let's say that and, and here's the other thing um as colton mentioned we would just be taking Ka kahului 3 out first which is 12 megawatts not the whole 36 so we don't have to have the entire replacement you know in place at, at that time we just have to make sure we have enough to replace k3 um so we we have flexibility to move that up and in fact um you know we can probably wait until um you know as late as say mid 2022 you know to put you know the um the mark in the ground that says okay you know we can't move it up any further than this so we have a lot of flexibility there and, and that's our intent as soon as we're in a position that we think that we can go ahead and take K3 offline and do the conversion. Uh, that's what we plan to do. And, and and again, I apologize if this isn't such a great question, but if if some of the grid services can provide the voltage support expected from the synchronous condensers instead of the capacity and energy that's expected from the stage one and stage two projects, could that also be a trigger to starting the conversion of K3 sooner? Dean, this I have is to cool. put that back to the plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, it took me a while to find the unmute button again. Um, yes, we, we can definitely, if if uh, reactive power and voltage control can be provided by, by DR resources or any resources, uh, we, we definitely can, would want to take advantage of that. Uh, it we, we need to determine, right, what capability is because it needs to not just be provided, but it needs to be provided in the right locations. Um, but certainly if it if it's there, if the function is there in sufficient uh, amount of VARs, then that can help with the voltage, reactive power and voltage control capability. <laughs> I, I want to make it clear that I, I speak to reactive power and voltage control as two separate things. They are related. Uh, but reactive power ensures that you have enough sort of voltage support. But in addition to providing voltage support, we also need to provide voltage control. In other words, to be to actively be able to control the voltage on the 23 kV system as changes happen uh, over the course of, of a day or you know minutes as load increases or decreases as amount of uh, of you know inductive and reactive load changes on the system and as <clears throat> um, voltages on the system change because of loading levels you want to be able to actively manage that voltage so it's really all of those services that you would need in order to replace what uh Kali provides so if I can reframe, as long as um, any efforts to obtain, um, say, DER or any type of grid services makes clear not only the um, the voltage support, but also the, the, the control, that could be used to accelerate the retirement of the, the, generate, the Kahului generating units. Yeah, and, you know, and to that point, so yes, yes, Dean, but, but to that point, uh, and others can speak to us because I'm I'm not so as close to this, but um, that that's a control by command, right? As you need to respond to uh, changing lows and changing grids uh, events to actively manage that voltage. Uh, I'm not aware of a place that is today doing that through DERs, but you know we'll we'll take a look at that. 
there there are instances where like even here in Hawaii where DRs are providing VARs uh, and have a fixed curve for response. But um, I think what we would need to look at is how could you harness that for active voltage uh, management? No, understood. Thank you. Sorry, Dean, let me go ahead. Uh, just want it's I mean, it's Mark. I just wanted to add a little bit to Colton's uh, response and maybe amend it a little bit. The, the um, when we did the transmission studies for central Maui, um, what we were finding is that we did need, as Colton was saying, voltage support on the 23 kV system. Um, and, and what Colton was just mentioning, um, I'm not sure, we'd have to take a closer look at this, but whether having um, VAR resources on the 12 kV actually would um, provide the voltage support needed uh, during the the contingencies or the n minus one events that were that would lead to causing voltage collapse. So it was um, now in the study we did look at certain alternatives, like if we had um, other power electronic devices like statcoms, which um, you know are power electronics like like inverters, and we did find certain locations on the system where we could place those devices to. Um, mitigate the voltage concerns that we had. So I guess the short answer is we're not, uh, I'm not sure whether to satisfy the voltage requirements, um, whether the grid services we're seeking is a one-for-one -one substitute for that. Yep, but but Dean, to your, to your question, um, you know, although we still have some questions on our part with what it would take to make that happen, I, I don't think that should hold us up from making that part of our discussion with the DR parties uh, on a DR grid services, right? Let's see if that's something that can be done, if it makes sense, um, and start that off by having that conversation with the DR parties. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I promise I, I'll, I'll try not to ask uh, too many more questions, but I have a couple left. Um, I, I think the situation on Maui is a little different than the situation in, in uh, than Oahu in terms of the magnitude of the loss of, of you know the AES coal plant versus the Kahului power plant. Um, in this particular instance, Maui Electric has indicated that deferral of maintenance on some of the generating units is another alternative, but unlike the um, the transition plan or the status update that you provided for Oahu, um, the uh, the plan on Maui didn't really quantify uh, which units and how much capacity we might be talking about. Do you guys have a sense of you know when you guys when excuse me when when Maui Electric has discussed the availability of maintenance deferral as uh, another uh, contingency, what exactly are we talking about? Um, you know, what capacity or, or what, what needs would it met? Would, would there still, I mean, th does that provide a large margin or a small margin? C can you help me understand? Sure, Bob, can you take that one? I can. So uh, I'm going to, Answer your question, Dean. If I'm not answering the question that you asked, let me know. Um, but if if we're talking about near term before a lot of the stage one and stage two projects come in, any kind of shortfalls there, you know, the graph Colton showed is that there's potentially a big shortfall, you know, in August, September this year. That That is something that we could mitigate by just not doing some of the maintenance that we have planned and we want to do on the combustion turbines. Um, we just wouldn't do them. And that's a function of whether, you know, how much load rebounds from COVID. I mean, if it's anything like it has been, then there'll be margins in, in that time frame. But if the loads become higher, you know, we can mitigate that. If we're talking about adjusting the maintenance schedules to allow Kahului to retire without doing anything else, we that's not going to work. Maintenance schedules aren't going to satisfy that. Okay. And Bob, Bob, just to just for some clarity, um, the CTs you're talking about, which ones oh, and what gigawatts for for the near yeah, term so, twenty one? 
Yeah, so we've got four combustion turbines at Malaya. They're each um, a little bit over 20 megawatts each. But, you know, the total with the um, the combined cycle, you know, they're, you know, they're 50, 60 megawatts, more like 60 megawatts a piece um, for the combined cycles. So, um, you know, specifically the combustion turbines um, that we could just defer some of that maintenance that we'd like to do. Um, and Colton mentioned it. We just recently, not only on the four combustion turbines that are operational, um, we also have a spare, which comes in really handy on Maui, and that just went through its 50,000 hour overhaul. So um, we're in pretty good shape to handle, you know, small, smaller short-term shortfalls there. Okay, thank you. Um, and it's my understanding that as as you retire the the plant, there are certain uh, there's a long lead time associated with the retirement of the plant. Based on the graph, it looks like you guys are scheduled. I mean, it's it's like a six month schedule, so you're really not going to start anything until you folks are are comfortable in terms of starting that uh, no return path of of shutting down the plant. Is is that right, or is is there a different timeline? That, that's required for the shutdown of the the generating units, not necessarily the plant, but the generating units. Yeah, so, you know, take K3, for example. Once we take K3 offline, then we have to do the work to do the conversion and get all, you know, we have to add a pony motor, we have to change lube oil systems, there's lots of things that we have to do. That process takes about three months, you know, for one unit to be converted into a synchronous condenser. So we would take K3 off, you know, spend three months converting it. Once it's converted, then we would operate it as a synchronous condenser and take K4 offline and do its conversion. So that's why it's a six month process. Okay, no, no um, thank you for that clarification too. And then, um, sorry, just one last question that's maybe more clarification. You, you folks identified as a po possible contingency putting DG at Kuihelani substation. Um, when you say DG, are you talking about fossil fuel fire distributed generation or is that a different type of distributed generation that would be placed there? Um, we, we were we're mostly talking about fossil fuel fired diesel generators that we would lease up to five megawatts. Um, I think I mentioned this in a previous uh, status conference. We also looked into whether or not we could lease batteries sure. and put them there. Um, it, so maybe get a little bit more megawatts because then the EIS or, you know, the environmental review requirements wouldn't kick in. Um, that doesn't seem to be all that practical, though. All right. All right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for indulging my questions, Chair. I, I cede the time back to you folks. Don't worry. It's not an indulgence. Do you have, do you have other anything else? No, I, I think those covered the, the major questions. I think the remaining questions we'll just have to throw into the applications themselves. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, but we've been at this for a little while. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. Let's reconvene at 2.45 uh, and then we'll go through the questions from the our staff and commissioners. So thanks everyone. Uh, thanks to the Hawaii Electric team. Thanks Dean. Um, we will see you promptly. We'll, we'll start up again at 2.45. So Please everyone be you know at least a minute or so before so we can uh, get ready to roll. Thank you.
Okay, it looks like we have folks logging back in. Thanks. Gonna go to our host, our driver here. There he is. How are we doing? We're good. We're ready. Okay. I think um got ready to Scott, uh Point Electric Cloud, you guys ready to start up again? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll bring the status conference back online here and start up with the questions from commission staff. Uh, we'll start with Dave Parsons. Okay, um, thanks. I just had a couple questions. So I guess this one might be for Colton. Um, it's it's about the permits that um, for the uh, Kahului power plant, um, and I get from what I understand the plant now has uh, permits to operate until the end of 2025. And I've, if I remember right, that's somewhat later than you know what we had heard before, you know, 2023 or 2024. So can you um, explain sort of what happened there and um, you know what the what happened with the permitting there? So uh, I should take that, Colton. Okay, Bob, Bob, thanks, Bob. Yeah. So uh, the the one permit, the main permit that we had talked about before, was a permit that allows discharging our cooling water into the ocean because we pull up water from the ground. Um, we use it to cool. We don't add, for the most part, we don't add much to the to the water, and then we release it. Um, you know, as of a couple, as of a year ago, or maybe a little bit more, um, it looked like we weren't going to continue to be able to meet the requirements because the EPA did not allow for consideration that the water that you're bringing up out of the ground might already be above limits. Um, but the EPA changed their rules uh, more recently that allow us to take what are called intake credits, allow us to subtract out the contaminants that are already in the water when we pull it from the ground. Uh, in doing so, uh, the Department of Health was able to renew our permit. We got that permit renewal, I believe it was in December of 2020, could have been November. Um, and so now that uh, permit that allows discharging, we have a new permit in hand that expires at the end of 2025 because it's a five-year permit. That doesn't mean we couldn't renew it again in 2025, it's just that it's a five-year permit. Yeah, and that's that's the NPDES, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit. Yeah. Correct. Okay, thanks, Bob. And does that have any? Does that you know in, come with any um, restrictions on the operations of the facility or anything like that, or is it similar to how it is now? It, it's similar to how it is now. That would not restrict operation of the plant. Um. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. So then the other kind of set of questions I had was around, um, I believe it's slide eight from, um, from your presentation, uh, Colton, um, which, which shows, um, yep, this one. Okay. So, um, the question, one question I had was, it says here that, you know, in terms of replacing the capacity. Um, prerequisite for replacing KPP would be um, getting, you know, the 115 megawatts of storage plus the 11 megawatts of um, capacity from the DR programs or the 40 megawatts of grid charging storage. So I'm wondering what is this like a, is there some sort of study that um, that you all did about sort of what's the trade off here between DR and um, you know hybrid solar storage versus uh, standalone storage here. Hey Dave, uh, this is Colton. So there, the eleven megawatts of uh, DR services, and and I welcome Shelley and Yo to to jump in. That's the total uh, of these three uh, programs. Uh, the Reliability analysis that we did uh, assumed that level of contributions uh, from those three programs 
uh, you know, based around the, the characteristics of those programs, and then looked at different combinations of, of the stage one and stage two projects that ultimately led to that later chart that shows the uh, energy reserve margin. Uh, we did not study, I think this is your question, Dave, did not study whether there should be a different sort of combination between uh, DR services uh, and, and grid scale resources. We took the DRs we were able to procure uh, through the fast DR as well as to the two uh, grid services RFPs uh, and were able to award and uh, included that in our calculations. Okay, so just to clarify, then you're saying that you know based on the the studies you have done, the you know 126 megawatts or so of um, storage plus plus um, DR would be sufficient to replace the 36 megawatts of capacity from the KPP facility, or do you also need the 40 megawatts of standalone storage to provide that? So 166 megawatts of, of total capacity for the 36. Yeah, maybe we weren't as clear in the in the wording in the bullet. Uh, Greg, if I can have you shift to slide 17. This picture might make it a little bit more clear. So uh, what what's so we don't have in this chart. Uh, we can definitely do some follow-up analyses on this, Dave, but we don't have a line on this chart that represents a scenario of the stage one, all the stage one projects, uh, the, the various grid services, including the fast ER, and only the stage two solar plus storage, uh, but without the Wayana battery. That's not shown in this chart in, in any one of those lines. Uh, we just kind of, sort of wanted to do sort of the bookends and something that represents um, something that's that's in the middle. Um, but I think your question is all the solar plus storage, not just the stage one ones, uh, plus grid services. Uh, so we can we can perform that calculation and and add it to this chart. Okay. Yeah. Because the way it was on the the prior slide. But it sort of had the or in there. Mis yeah, the or was misleading. I apologize okay. for that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I did. I did have one other question on the um, prerequisite slide. Dave, Dave if you would uh, mind going back. Oh, sorry. Dave, sorry, if I could just chime in real quick on that last question. Is um, even with that portfolio, uh, you know, to the extent that projects drop out or get delayed, you know. Um, you know, because like we saw Kamole leave and then come back that, you know, the portfolio as a whole is kind of um, helping to meet the reliability need, um, you know, rather than relying on a single project to, to be able to assure the reliability. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so then my, my other question was about the other, um, it, was, it was actually back on the slide eight, Greg, if you wouldn't mind going back to that one. Um, so it, the other the other prerequisite I, I just wanted to ask about is the, the sufficient grid forming capability. Um, is, is, that, is there a megawatt amount of, of capacity that provides this, this capability that is needed? Um, what, what do you, or I guess the other way that, what does it mean where it says sufficient grid forming capability? Yeah, Mark, can you speak to that one? Yeah. So, um, I think at this point, it's hard to say, um, or to quantify, um, as you were asking, I think what we, we do want to say here is that the. Uh, you know, what we're finding in, in the interconnection studies, among other studies, is that uh, the system does need grid forming capability, um, especially in these scenarios where we expect to run the system with uh, majority inverter based resources, you know, for example, upwards of 90 plus percent inverter based resources supplying the load. Um, 
So what we did in stage two is that we did require all of the stage two projects to have grid forming capability. Um, so the idea there is, you know, having multiple grid forming inverters online at a time, much like, you know, you do have uh, multiple sync generators online at a time helps to reinforce and provide some level of redundancy um, for stability. And so what we're looking for in terms of grid forming is, you know, providing that dynamic um, response and voltage response that can be much quicker than, say, a grid following uh, inverter um, can provide. Um, Dave, and, go sorry, ahead, go Mark. Ahead. Yeah, Dave, the, the other reason why it's it's not just a, a certain number is because the grid forming capability of inverter based system varies by the particular uh, model of inverter and and how they're they're designed and up and programmed um, that's hampered by the fact that right now in industry there is no standard uh, for grid forming functionality there's no sort of baseline industry standards of what inverters need to do in order to provide uh, grid forming functionality. I'm, a, I'm actually on the IEEE uh, executive committee, and this is one of the things we're talking about establishing is establishing an IEEE standard for this, because right now uh, what's happening is that individual equipment manufacturers are developing grid forming capability and comparing one uh, to the other, uh, you'll, you'll see differences. And so it's hard to come up with just a single number to say you need X megawatts or something like that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I think, you know, it's a, an area of, of active and um, I think uh, interest and, and work from a lot of folks in the industry, including you all. So I, I but I, I guess what, what the reason I'm asking is because it says that it's a prerequisite for the retirement, but, you know, it's like, well, what happens if we, if, you know, there's projects that are delayed or, or don't, you know, um, aren't, uh, successfully developed um, but it's it sounds like you're confident that with if we got all the stage two projects that that you would have sufficient grid forming capability but it's still an area that you're studying is that fair yeah it's still an area that we need to study further but you know preliminary indications are that um you know stated another way if if we if we um, didn't have grid forming inverters and we had the same type of inverters that were on the stage one projects, the system would be unstable, um, uh, you know, with uh, certain dispatches where you're, you know, you're pretty much running off inverters. So, um, you know, to remove that sort of any must run or synchronous generation commitments, um, we do need these stage two projects um, providing that grid forming capability. Uh, and at, at least that's what sort of the preliminary, you know, the IRS type analysis is showing. Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so then my last question, I guess, on this was about um, the, the voltage support and the, um, the synchronous condensers. I, I wanted to follow up on a question that Dean was asking um, about the potential to accelerate the time, um, the development timeline for for that project. And um, I thought, Bob, I thought I heard you say that something about mid 2022, and I, I just wanted to clarify if that was a construction start time frame or completion of the project time frame that you thought you had the flexibility to to accommodate or what what, what that was about. Yes, sorry if I created some confusion there. Um, no, we couldn't do the projects in 2022. We, we can remain flexible in moving the time forward. You know, to, we, we can wait till the middle of 2022 to make a decision you know, to move it, the construction earlier. I mean, the construction would happen after other resources go online and after there's been a sufficient amount of time to ensure that those new resources um, you know, aren't having infancy problems and, and, you know, make sure that they're reliable, right? Um, a lot of times projects come online and they'll have 
you know, they work, but they're not perfect at first. And it, it takes a few months to get that, that down pat. So um, as far as moving the time of starting, um, I would say that potentially, you know, third quarter of 2023 would be, you know, how far we could move it up. Bob, I think, to, I think to clarify, you know, you're saying that come mid 2022, we would have a better picture of how we've been able to accelerate some of the other projects. And that would then allow us at that point to probably make a, a determination, you know, to go ahead and start, you know, our own acceleration of the um, synchronous condenser project. That's thank you, Scott. That's probably a more succinct way to put it. Hopefully that helps. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, the reason for the question is because it, it appears, I, I think if I'm kind of stacking up the different Gantt charts, right, and, you know, later in the, the presentation slides here, it, it appears that the, con, con, I guess if you take these prerequisites as, you know, at face value, that these are the prerequisites, that the conversion of, of K3 and K4 is sort of the critical path here, right? It, that has to happen before and, and so it's the last thing on the ske on all of the schedule. So I'm trying to understand, you know, what are the opportunities, if any, to accelerate that? And I, I, I think you said perhaps six months um, could be found in that schedule. Um, just wanted to confirm if that's sort of what you meant, Bob. I, yeah, let, let's call it four to six months. Um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to go all the way to six, but that's depending upon what happens with the other projects possibly. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I'll, I'll move on then. I, I think the other set of questions I had was about the reliability analyses. Um, and so I'm, I was looking at the, um, the filing that you all made on April 5th and, um, and also, you know, the, the previous filing from January on the adequacy of supply. So there's, you know, in both cases, I think the, the filings are showing, um, you know, planning criteria violations in um, 2021 and 2022. Though I did know it, if I read it right, it looked like the um, April 5th filing was showing, um, uh, you know, 20, 28 hours of violations in 2022 compared to 46 hours of violations in, in the adequacy of supply report. Um, and and the April fifth didn't didn't talk about 2021, but in the um, adequacy of supply, it said that there was going to be 138 hours of violations in 2021. I'm just wondering, um, you know, well, first of all, do, do you under, do you know what is the difference between the two um, the two analyses that were were filed? Was there an update or or some change in the in the method that happened for the April fifth version? Yeah, I think there were some differences in assumptions and inputs that uh, happened between the AOS and the most recent analysis that was in our our filing. Mark, can you speak to what some of those differences are? Yeah, I'd have to. Yeah, I, I, sorry, Dave. I I have to go back and look at uh, specifically the details of. The differences of in assumptions there. Okay. Um, let but, me see if I can get in, that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I I was just gonna say. I mean, I think in both cases it's showing that there's risk in in 2021 and 2022. And I, I I'm so I guess if that's correct. Given that, um, what you know, what actions are being taken to mitigate those risks, specifically for 2021 and 2022, um, you know, given the short time frame, I think we're talking, you know, August, September is when the, the most um, severe violations were, um, were shown. So what, what, is, what is being done to address the, the near-term reliability risk for Maui? Yeah, so, so Dave, this is Colton. Um, First, first of all, I think the biggest lever we have is to make adjustments to our maintenance schedule. The reliability charts, uh, I think that's one of the, I'm sorry, the uh, maintenance schedules, I think are one of the things that might've changed between 
the, the AOS and, and this updated analysis subject to, to check. But that can have a huge impact uh, on, on our ERM calculations. Um, right now, there's, you know, as for, for understandable reasons, the forecast of our electricity peaks uh, has been very dynamic because of the very unusual circumstances we're in with the pandemic and the economic impact. So we're showing uh, in our forecast peaks in, in energy sales that um, are higher than what we've been experiencing in reality uh, uh, late last year and even the beginning of this year. Um, so if we, but if we do um, see peaks this year and energy sales this year um, that that are at the levels of our near-term forecast update, um, then that's you know that's the opportunity to make changes or deferrals uh, in our maintenance that Bob talked about, that would, which would have the biggest impact. And you know that's something that they constantly look at. Not speaking for Bob, but they they're always looking at adjusting. Uh, their schedules. Uh, in the case for Maui, um, because these CTs, these combined cycles that these CTs are part of, um, are are really relatively large units relative to the Maui system. Changing their maintenance can have a big impact on an ERM calculation. So I think first and foremost, uh, it'll be it'll be that. Uh, of course, you know it's the it's also the the additional DERs that we mentioned. Uh, we wanna see if there's an opportunity there. That's probably be more of a 2022 opportunity, uh, but we wanna get started on, on that um, as soon as we can as well. Um, Bob, anything else to add on maintenance or, or Mark or others? Um, the only other thing that I'll add is that I think the violation, the potential violations that you see in 2021 are worse than 2022 uh, because of the maintenance schedule. In, in 2021, we're showing that we would take out um, one of the two CTs that's part of the combined cycle and the full steam turbine at the same time, um, you know, if we do certain types of maintenance. Whereas in 2022, we've already um, We've adjusted the maintenance schedule such that at no time do we have the full steam turbine out at the same time as one of the combustion turbines. So you just don't see as large of outages for maintenance in 2022, and and that's on purpose. So to put an end to this, uh, our response, Bob, will be looking at 2021 adjustments to the maintenance schedules for the CTs. Well, what we're going to do, like I said before, is we're going to keep the maintenance schedule as it is. And as the year goes by and we see how, uh, you know, whether or not the loads have picked up, um, you know, we might defer some of that maintenance that we've scheduled. So if if loads stay low like they were last year and they have so far this year, um, I think we can probably do most of that maintenance that we have scheduled. But if if the loads pick up, you know, if there's more return to tourism in the hotels, on Maui, then um, we'll just defer some of that work, which we don't think will cause any kind of uh, major issues for us. It's minor. Okay. So the, it's sort of, uh, you'll be constantly assessing the situation as you get closer to that, that period in the late summer and December yeah, that, at that point. That's correct. I think that's, I think that's prudent for this year. Um, just because it's hard to predict exactly what the demand is going to be. Um, okay, thanks. I, I did have one other question. This is a little um, tangential, so I can, if I'm stepping out of bounds, um, someone can cut me off. But I, I also notice in the adequacy of supply that the, um, the reliability uh, criteria for Lanai are also. Um, uh, significant violations are are reported there for uh, 2021, actually through through the whole uh, planning period. So I, I'm just curious, um, and and it, uh, you know, in contrast to you know the discussion that is in the adequacy of supply about the maintenance and you know some other things, there's no discussion of any potential mitigation um, for that situation um, specific to Lanai. So I, I'm just curious why 
that is or and what what actions um, if any are, are being taken to address the reliability for um, for Lanai. Dave, I'll, I'll take a swing and ask others to to join in as well. Uh, so, you know, in the case of Lanai, Lanai, we've had, um, you know, several challenges. We have uh, received a request uh, from Pulama to discontinue operation uh, of the CHP unit. Um, and uh, we've been working with Pulama as they've con continued to adjust their projections of what they plan to do uh, with with their facilities. Um, but in terms of reliability based upon a set of assumptions, it's definitely not uh, where where we want to be. For, for the island of Lanai, though, I do want to note that we set a fairly high uh, ERM percentage as the criteria uh, for that island, just based upon uh, the transition from the, a deterministic criteria that we had been using to the for that island uh, uh, as we migrate over uh, to the probability based ER, ERM. And so we set conservatively for that island a fairly high ERM percentage for that. But the CHP, uh, the reduced operations uh, from uh, La Ola have all reduced generation contributions that we're trying to work through. Um, we do we do see for the longer term, right? The RFP that we're looking to do to be uh, a big part of the longer term solution uh, for for the island. Uh, but we're near term beyond that. Uh, you know, it comes to accelerating uh, DR additions on the island, uh, and like every other system, what can we do in making adjustments to uh, the existing units that we have there so we can increase their availability. Okay, so if I heard you right, you're you're going to explore the possibility of um, demand response for for you know these other islands as well. Yeah, I think your term because because the longer term stuff isn't like till 2025, 2026, right? I mean that's sort of the timeline that has been general time frame. Yeah. Yeah, we do have riders, I believe, on the island of of Lanai, but I'm I it's been years since I've looked at those in detail. But those riders allow for uh interruption on that island, I believe. Okay. Um thanks. Um Chair, those are all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh we'll go to Chief Counsel Caroline Ishida. <laughs> thanks, Chair. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. The first one is just to circle back to uh, Dave's question about the NPDES permit. I'm wondering if you all know if there's anywhere where the um, all of the permits that the Kahului plant needs and has are filed sort of a list are filed in one place with sort of the various timelines that apply to those permits. And if not, um, if it would be possible to do that, just because I think that um, knowing sort of when these timelines change and what parameters are involved in the permits, since they provide in some ways the bookend to retirement. Um, it would be good for us to be able to see that and then also just to be transparent about whether there are any changes or you all are seeking any changes related to those permits. If that exists somewhere, um, let me know. But if not, it would be great to um, have that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of anywhere it exists. We'll put something like that together for you. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, the second question is just um, one about timing. Uh, I noticed that Miko's application for the Wa'ena Bess was filed on September 8th of 2020, and then the application for the Wa'ena Switchyard was filed about six weeks later on October 22nd. And um, given that the Bess seems to rely on approval of the Switchyard and uh, that you sort of anticipate the Switchyard coming online first, I'm just wondering from a planning perspective why the applications were filed in that order. Caroline, this is Colton. I'll take a swing and ask those familiar with the project um, to, to add in some detail. Um, so one of the things that drove the timing uh, 
you know, let's 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 talk about the switchyard. So the the battery project has a longer execution schedule than than the switchyard. Uh, and and so we wanted to make sure that that process started uh, sooner. The the other thing though that factored in here is that the switchyard that we're proposing, although it becomes a a, a, a a very convenient location for a battery project to and other projects to interconnect, the driver for the switchyard was to be an effective transmission solution uh, by creating, you know, adding breakers, adding relay protection that allows us to take longer transmission lines, segment them out so that when we experience contingencies, faults, and the resulting impacts can be can be minimized. And that really helps to uh, reduce uh, transmission line overloads because you have your more of your transmission system intact uh, with the switchyard. The, the reason, part of the reason of the timing for the switchyard application is driven by the fact that the transmission impacts, the needs, the, the, the changes that the transmission system was seeing, uh, not just with the planned retirement of Kalui power plant, but with the projects that were being added as part of the stage one and stage two projects, were having significant impacts on power flows on the transmission system during normal and contingency situations. So we wanted to account for and incorporate the benefits of the stage one and stage two projects based upon where they are located uh, you know, for their projects and how that that changes, i.e., reduces the solution needed to address the transmission overload when Cogley goes uh, offline and becomes retired. Uh, and so, in the process of looking at incorporating those changes into the transmission system uh, and taking the time to do that, um, we were able to save almost $30 million in the cost of the transmis transmission solution uh, by, by incorporating uh, all of the changes that were happening on the transmission system. The downside of that to, to your question, Caroline, is that it resulted in us taking the time to incorporate that additional later information ultimately into the solution and the application and that resulted in uh, an application later than what we would have uh, otherwise been able to deliver, but we felt it was worth it because we could uh, propose a project that was, I think, I think the, the true number was like $28 million less than what it would have been otherwise. Okay, thanks. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll um, pass it back to the chair. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, let's move on to the commissioner's questions. Commissioner Tuncian. Thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of clarifying questions. And uh, Colton, I'll address them to you, but then you can have um, the, the person that uh, probably better and you can flag them off for me. Uh, sure. On the slides 11, 12, and 13, these are the schedules for the different projects. I uh, wanted to make sure uh, the GCODs that are listed. Those are the currently contracted GCOD. So, for example, that like out of um, the PPAs that were approved or at least proposed, those are those dates that we see there. Yeah, subject to confirmation from from Greg, this represents the current dates. So, efforts that we are undertaking right now to accelerate things, accelerate our parts, or accelerate our steps. Uh, are not reflected uh, in in these schedules just yet. Okay. And, and you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, time buffers and the like, yeah, right? there's, there's ample supply or ample time here uh, to make sure that these projects and everything, you know, the prerequisite are is done before we get to actual closure you know, or at least partial closure, if you will, of KPP. Um, does that buffer include, you know, what I like to lump it as, as more regulatory versus permitting, uh, you know, such as if a project, right, is installed for whatever reason, if, it, if it's appealed, 
right, on the on our decision either by the PC or by even permitting going forward. Uh, is that all calculated in, um, right, as as the buffer? And 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 it might not show here. I'm just asking because we're talking about schedules and the like to make sure that I have a firm understanding of what that buffer, you know, all is included in that buffer. So commissioner, just to clarify your question about the buffer is the buffer between these uh, stage, say, for example, these stage one projects shown here and the buffer or the time frame between these project schedules uh, and our work to take Kali power plant offline. Is that the buffer and time frame you're referring to? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so Bob, jump in if I don't have this completely right or to add some more detail. But the uh, timing for um, beginning the process of taking Kalui 3 uh, offline to begin the conversion of it into a synchronous condenser, that buffer, so to speak, uh, uh, is conditioned on the timing shown here in this chart. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that shows when these projects uh, are on schedule based upon their schedule expected to come online. So it presumes these stage one and stage two projects come online, including the, the switch yard come online as shown in this chart. That buffer is to uh, address um, infancy issues that, that Bob mentioned, uh, getting everyone's arms, the developers, operators, and our operators' arms around the use of the re those resources, resources in its replacement uh, service role so that we can then take Kali offline. And that's where Bob spoke to um, some flexibility that if if that that process uh, results in you know a quicker uh, comfort on getting those units, you know as part of a uh, as in our system operating regularly and comfortably, there's some uh, potential to accelerate the start of the Kali process. Uh, but the schedules themselves, including the, the yellow arrows here, uh, uses or assumes the, the current schedule for these pro projects and doesn't uh, account for, include any, any contingency for appeals on permits or, or regulatory steps. Okay. Hope that helped. Okay. Then uh, the last question I had is on slide 16. Um, right, the contingent contingency options, and I know you folks noted that uh, the company would prefer not to do any of, of, of them. But should you need to do any of these? Are these listed in any kind of order or priority on which one you would look to doing first or second or or last resort? Uh, I'll I'll tell you. Uh, Commissioner, that it wasn't put into this slide with any particular order. Uh, each of these have potential contingency values, um, but they also have different sort of prerequisites in terms of timelines that you need to enable these. Uh, and of course, they'll come with different costs. So making maintenance adjustments, deferring overhaul elements, for example, uh, you know, has a completely different profile from taking the effort to go and lease DG's source diesel fuel or biofuel for that resource and getting it installed and operating it. Yeah. So they'll each have its own sort of be time for lack of better term associated with it. But there but there's no priority or urgency listing on here. I I would assume that I I it, it's fair to say adjusting your maintenance outage schedule has the least from a external perspective of approvals and so on. However, as I think we all understand, that does come with some additional risk, right? If you are going to push out adjust uh, maintenance, so that's that's the the other two um, involve permitting, involve um, you know operational uh, you know installation of equipment, uh, right? If we have to modify fuel uh, at the at the plant, so more complicated for sure. But Bob, you can add, jump in here too. I was going to go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I don't really, uh, I don't have anything of material to add. 
I was, I was going to add that, um, you know, based on this, I, I would assume that what we're really going to focus on is getting those projects online so that it falls back into that graph, right, that we can kind of rely on that graph of things coming in, right, and then for you folks, right, one of the, the prerequisites of uh, looking at uh, synchronous condensers, right, converting them over and the like. I think, I mean, from what I'm hearing, I'm not, you know, it's not listed here, but my interpretation is that, right, that, that's really the priority. The priority is on getting those, right, all of those prerequisites that are listed on the other slide before we even get to these contingency options. Yeah, maybe I can, um, you know, just going back to our, our three overarching objectives, we actually want to re retire um, Kahului Power Plant um, as soon as we can, but the as soon as we can depends on making sure we have those resources, those new renewable storage resources in in place, um, so that we can uh, you know obviously make make uh, make our reliability uh, margins and such. So, one of the things that um, you know when I think about the buffer uh, to your question, Commissioner, your earlier question, you know we know that we can technically operate that plant through the end of 25 given existing permits. Um, anything beyond that, it gets complicated, even more complicated in terms of additional permits and, you know, switching over to ultra low sulfur diesel or those types of, uh, uh, requirements. So our plan is not ever to have to run this plant beyond 25, which then circles back to the major focus is what you see here, uh, accelerating those, those other projects and, and, uh, synchronous condensers and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just to add real quickly, Commissioner, I, I, you know, before we even get to those three options, you know, consistent with the portfolio approach, um, you know, we are going to be looking at DER uh, very closely to, to see if we can get that online as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I think that's, that's all the questions I have. Here are you back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Potter. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today and sharing this presentation with us, and as well as the update on the Clearway projects, where we were all very excited to see that as an opportunity unfolding um, that we can pursue and perhaps find some relief um, in in some of the constraints we're we're working against. Um, so, so thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I'm just, I'm going to begin by um, asking a little bit about, you know, Guyana Bess has been kind of a hot topic so far, so I'll just continue that line of questioning a little bit. Um, so the Bess project is going to come online in 2022, um, which is, it allows, you know, the companies to garner quite a bit of experience operating the battery. And the battery is actually capable of providing reactive power, um, voltage support, voltage stability, FFR. It has it has more than the more capability than just providing capacity. And so, and I and I know you're all aware of that. But in the in the next year, you're planning on imp including synchronous condensers to provide essentially those functions of you know of voltage support. And and I'm curious to hear on whether you're doing that for reliability or if you're trying to just have sort of these types of projects be mutually exclusive so that they are not sort of value stacking um, the types of services that they can provide. Is there, there a reason why you're not going to just sort of maximize the YNA best um, and, and maybe consider not doing the synchronous condensers or maybe only one um, in order to minimize the cost to the ratepayers? Yeah, so uh, Commissioner Potter, I'll, I'll start and ask uh, Mark Asano to to add to it. Um, so when we when we look at uh, providing reactive power and voltage uh, control uh, from say Yena as well as from the synchronous condensers, right? As much as possible, we want that function to happen without having to rely. Uh, on must run fossil generation. So it's not just to potentially be the replacement for Kali power plant, but what we're looking for is the provision of voltage control from newer resources that allows us to 
turn off or not start conventional generation that would otherwise need to in order to provide that. The other thing that gets specific to your question about why Waena and synchronous condensers uh, is because of the unique location of Kali power plant. So the Waena um, storage project, uh, which is expected to come line, online in the first half of 2023, is connected uh, to the Waena switchyard, which is part of the 69 kV transmission system. Uh, so unfortunately, it's in not in the location that can provide the same local uh, reactive power needs and voltage control on the 23 kV system uh, that that Kahului provides. And that's why in total, in looking at the entire system, we're looking from both set of resources providing voltage control and, and reactive power. Mark, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think you covered it. it is the voltage issue is a locational issue. And so you know, where the Waena best is located versus where the Kahului condensers would be located um, does matter in the analysis. I, um, and I can go back and check, but I think the study that was part of the application did look at some sensitivities around including Waena best um, as a possible source. And I think we are still thinking that based on the results, the analysis that uh, we, we still needed a voltage source on the 23 kV system. Okay. And just, just to clarify, because I'm, I'm a little, now I'm a little confused because what we just talked about and, and chief counsel asked you was, you know, the connection between the switch yard where the, and, and that would connect the KPP synchronous condensers and help with that transmission condenser and also the 69 kV lines are also feeding in to that switch yard. So, so what am I missing? Like, I, I guess if. So, yes. yeah, when the, when the Kahului power plant um, is no longer generating power, um, most of the power to serve central Maui is going to be flowing from the 69 kV system down through the 23 kV system. So okay. uh, essentially what the, Kahului power plant does today is it relieves some of that loading that needs it relieves the power that needs to flow from 69 down to the 23 kV to the 12 kV system. So when you don't have that power source on the 23 kV system, then it creates overloads on the 69 kV system. So that's what the what NF switchyard is solving. Um, and then also along with that on the on purely just the 23 kV system, you need voltage support. And so that's where the condensers come into play, um, providing voltage support closer to the load center, um, you know, so IE on the 23 kV system near the, the loads. Okay. So there's, okay. yeah, th there's two kind of functions that are um, being solved that the Kahului power plant provides. So do you anticipate the Wayana best to provide to provide that frequency, or I'm sorry, the voltage support and the reactive power on the 69 kV line as well, or are you just perceiving it as a capacity tool? The so the the voltage problem that is that is triggered by the retirement of Kahului power plant is uh something that can't necessarily be solved from a resource on the 69 kV system. So the WENA best specifically won't mitigate the voltage issues caused by the Kahului retirement. On the other hand, it's, it does provide generally voltage support to the, the broader transmission system. To so the 69. Okay, that was my yeah. question. I was like, yeah. so you will be able to utilize that resource, the Wayana best for multiple applications. It's not just going to be a capacity resource. You'll be utilizing it for voltage support and other types of grid services that can help stabilize the system on the 69 side, but you need the synchronous condensers to help manage voltage support on the 23 kV. Yes, okay. that's correct. Got that, it. Thank yeah, you. that's correct. Yeah. Great, good, good. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch to um, to DERs and DR because it's my one of my favorite subjects. So 
I'm just curious, can you give an update on the progress of the GSPA 1 and 2 in terms of, of uh, the, the procurement and actually how much of that resource you have available on the grid now today? Can I direct that question to Yo Kawanami? Hi, Clinton. Thank you. Uh, hello, Commissioner Potter. Uh, I can answer Hi. that question. Uh, GSPA 1, which was approved and commenced last year, t took a little bit of a delay due to the pandemic, uh, but we are, the actual number, I am not sure, I think it's a few hundred kilowatts we have online with GSPA 1, and one of the larger components of the GSPA 1 is a battery system over at Maui College, and that should be online relatively soon, so that will give us a good bump this year. Uh, I Again, apologies on the numbers. I think that number was closer to 1.5 to 2 megawatts. Um, of, so that really brings the Maui's uh, 2.4, 2.7 megawatts to about 75, 80% enrolled within this year for GSPA 1. GSPA 2, we have two contracts, uh, one with an existing uh, OATI is the partner, so their integration time should be relatively shorter, uh, and they should be able to get going on the GSPA 2's enrollment uh, concurrently. And then the Swell Energy, they are going through the integration process right now with our uh, the RMS DERMS system. So once that is completed, uh, that should be completed late summer. Uh, they have roughly about six months, contractually they have about six months to integrate. Hopefully they won't need the entire amount of time, but uh, this is their first integration with us, so we're working on that right now. Okay, Yo, just to clarify, when you say integrate, it's not actually enrollment of any customers. It's you're just talking about like the communication protocols between their systems and your head end system, correct? That is that is correct, Commissioner. The word integrate is key for, so, so there's many uh, milestones for us. Receiving the commission approval to proceed with GSPA is one. And then the moment that happens, they are given a certain amount of time to connect to our DRMS Durham systems through communication, as you stated, so open ADR, basically. We need to ensure they are able to communicate with us once we give them the green light, then they, that's the very moment their month one of the 60 months of the five-year contract starts, so where they can enroll the customers thereafter. Okay, so there's no way for them to concurrently enroll customers while they're going through this integration process. So, so that's that's a that's an aggregator risk that they may take. Uh, that's their choice. They could actually enroll those customers today. It's just that they won't be paid per the contractual agreement. So the, the moment they integrate with our system, they could come back saying, "Oh, by the way, we already enrolled 100 customers. Here you go," and they could do that. So that's really up to them. And uh, typically, these aggregators give us a one-third, one-third, one-third answer to us, which means they are targeting one-third of their resource to an existing customers that they have, one-third of someone that's in the queue, and then one-third that's brand new. So they should be reaching out to the existing customers already, Commissioner. So that, sh that should help us give us a good bump from the beginning. From the start, that's great. Because one of the one of the things that's that's challenging is to see, you know, that that this in this slide deck, there's some references to the DER and to the GSPA in terms of being sort of a, a cushion or um, a, some a, a contingency for these shortfalls that we're going to experience this year and in 2022. Um, obviously, it sounds like 30 megawatts going out for 30 megawatts of additional DER and working closely with the DER parties is very aspirational <laughs> and you know considering the the lag and the timeline that we've seen with the gspa um so so my concern um you know i, I have sort of two concerns there is one we we need to tr really be expediting the schedule in order to alleviate at least in 2022 some of those some of the, the 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 shortfalls that we're seeing on the reserve margins, but um, you know, as far as this year, it doesn't sound like we have we have the ability to use DR um, as a resource to help alleviate some of the the pinch points that we're looking at because we just don't have the the aggregators up and up and running that we need to. Is that correct? 
for the currently approved GSP, th th that is correct. We may be able to accelerate with Swell Energy to see, and we can, of course, discuss, but uh, the number is still limited to whatever the commission and actually the, what Hawaiian Electric has agreed upon with Swell, so that's the limit for now. Um, to your point, Commissioner, uh, the Commission has given us a guidance on for Oahu, a emergency demand response program to accelerate Oahu's fulfillment of such capacity need. This is a very similar approach. So when Colton presented the 30 megawatts, we we had that very similar type of project uh, to be considered for Maui as well. And we are working with the DER parties. We met twice last week and once this week already to continue the discussion. What is that right level of program that could achieve some level of that mitigation. So we've been also discussing, myself have been discussing with Marco Sano's team on if we were to try to approach the need, where is it? And it seems to be, as Commission uh, stated, the evening peak time. So we are trying to target uh, that approach to see, okay, DER parties, what can we do quickly? What does that look like? So we have a P, uh, DER order program check meeting coming up next Wednesday. Uh, we will try to summarize that together with the consumer advocates team and the DER parties team, so the three parties to present to the commission. This is what we have been discussing. Wonderful. That's great. So I would heavily encourage you to um, include Hawaii Energy and energy oh, yeah. efficiency into the conversation. Um, they they definitely can contribute to to the cause for sure. So you know, I mean, this needs to be an all hands on deck kind of approach. Um, and, you know, just to pick up to, um, I, I believe it was Colton that mentioned that um, that Lanai, there would be an effort to, you know, to, uh, pertaining to Dave, Dave Parson's question, um, that, it, that DR would be pursued on Lanai. Is there anything in, in your horizon that, that would support that? Or is that? So for, if, if we were to go back to a little bit of a history for the past, Three four years, we have been blessed with the opportunity to tackle the aggregator approach first to ensure to see if the aggregators are able to participate on the state of Hawaii and provide these uh, grid service requirements. We've targeted the first RFP. Um, I, you know, Colton asked me this question, and it, was, it gave me a reminder. 2015, when we did this RFP, we actually didn't have a ceiling. We just wanted to see who could bid for what. Um, and then the second time around, we, with commission guidance, we ma maximized to the extent possible. And to everyone's notice, probably, we did not get the 100 megawatts type of bids. So I, that's, and hence, the commission has guided us, maybe we should look into programmatic approach. So we have been very active to coexist with the aggregators program track with something like an emergency demand response program. We are also looking into rooftop rental program, and we are also submitting a advance, submitted an advance rate design proposal. So what am I saying? The th I think it's going to be a three-prong, four-prong type of approach, Commissioner, to see how we can gather that 30 megawatts, not from a single approach, but collectively from the various approach, I think, is what we're looking at. And can that be translated to Lonai? I think it is translatable to Lonai. So I will have to work with Colton's team to identify what is that magic number. And frankly, personally, I don't know. My, I haven't done my homework. I don't know how much DER already is on Lonai. And to be able to assess that, uh, that, that would be my homework, Commissioner. Thank you, Yo, very much for your answers. I, I want to bring up one point. Um, in in the um, in the update, the the on the Kahalui of oh, the transition plan. Sorry, <laughs> like what's the word I'm looking for? And the tra Kahalui transition plan, trans transition plan. Um, the the there was a a footnote. It was footnote eleven. Um, and it was talking about grid services and, you know, and procuring the 30 megawatts um, for, for the island of Maui. And there was a statement about, you know, the, it, it referenced the hot, hot summer heat wave that happened in 2020 in California and how the Calis ISO um, found that, you know, what had been committed to market didn't actually manifest. And it was sort of a it seemed um, like an interesting way to sort of shirk off the reliability of demand response by referencing this this um, 
you know, report that that was isolated to a very specific and intense event. There was uh, the heat waves was uh, lasted a very long time. It was very intense. Um, and, you know, and we and we all, you know, in the DR practitioner world knows that not all DR shows up. But it was an interesting footnote to add to that transition transition plan. And I'm curious um, if you have any insight on why um, why that would have been included to sort of discount demand response as a resource for the island of Maui. I'll do my best to answer that, and I may need uh, Colton and Mark's uh, help with this. But it was a data point, Commissioner. Uh, to your point, I think you said it better than I could have, which is DR is not always there. And as an example, uh, the commissioner has commission has allowed us to proceed with fast DR of five megawatts of enrollment, which we were very excited for Maui, and we got the five megawatts. With that said, do we always get that five megawatts every single time? It's a little bit tricky to that point. And furthermore, uh, I think, Commissioner, you were there when the DER parties explained that they're not really happy personally with me when I mentioned a 10-day baseline approach and <laughs> to say who is delivering what at given time. From a system operations perspective, actually, it might be five megawatts, but mathematically, the 10-day baseline may result in a 3.94 megawatt delivery. So which is true? It, is a little bit of a headache for me that uh, I still uh, need to be conscientious on which number when I deliver to Mark's team on here is the good service number, which number am I giving? We try to do a very good job with our performance factor. The aggregators have a, quite a bit of pressure to deliver at a high performance, so we're looking forward to that. And our EMMV evaluation, measurement, and verification exercise will really tell us if aggregator can be performing at a high performance like they're supposed to. So. Commissioner, I think that was more or less a data point to tell us that, tell us, tell all of us that we just need to be cognizant that the numbers are not, when we say we're targeting this number, there always will be a little bit of a plus or minus numbers, mm -hmm. Commissioner. Um, Colton or Mark, um, if you could help. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, thanks, Yo. So, Commissioner Potter, to add to what Yo said, um, the that 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 passage in which that reference footnote is there is really there to say, in the context of proposing an additional programmatic D, DER services program to to get additional load reduction to help us through this 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 near term uh, shortfall that we have, was was really there to say that existing programs that we may have in place today may or may not deliver the amount of contracted megawatts, um, in part because customers, participants, right, that an aggregator sub, sub, uh, subscribes may or may not respond in the way that you would have liked them to. And, and it's only there to say that there might be an opportunity, much like the discussion we've had on the Oahu system, that a different program that perhaps is less constraining uh, that perhaps has the right set of incentives will get a customer who will not pull the trigger to do a, a response under an existing program may still be a resource that we can call upon uh, under a different program with different parameters because they have enough of incentive or it's not as restrictive such that they're more willing to participate. And for the for the purposes of a, of a, of a DER or DR resource that provides load reduction to help us with reliability, even if we ask for, say, 30 megawatts, like I cited, and we get 10, right? That's still 10 more megawatts than we would have had if we didn't call upon the program. So we're, we're trying to look for opportunities with that kind of response and those kinds of reductions, which may be different from what may be part of a more quote, traditional type of program. That's the context in which this is written, right? That, that To say that you, you don't stop there, right? When you don't get the response, you don't walk away from a program just because you don't get the response that you have, but what are opportunities to get additional response with a different set of parameters? And that and that's exactly right, Colton. You're out, you're spot on. I mean, the idea here is that when when you're looking at 30 megawatts and that's the goal that you're striving for, 
equipment is it not all the equipment is going to be on in the field you know people aren't going to have their air conditioners some of them will some of them won't so yep. there's it's it's you know but the idea is is what what i think is disconcerting is that you guys are beating the, this drum of we're going after DERs and DR and we're making it a priority. And then you're adding footnotes like that, that are just like, you're taking the, taking away the credibility of your claim that this is a priority for your organization. And so I, I, I'm glad to hear both of you commit to, you know, to, to this as a resource and providing it to not only Oahu, but also to Maui and in potentially Lanai. I really encourage you to look at Lanai. I think that that's, a, that needs to be there, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, that was, I was like, what are they doing? Yeah, <laughs> so, and I, Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner, maybe, maybe I can jump in here. I, I think that we all probably need to go to some writing class because uh, clearly the context of how we put that footnote in got lost. Um, the point being that we need to be perhaps even more aggressive in getting these types of resources just because of the built in uncertainty that just is inherent with uh, with these types of programs. But yeah, I can see how somebody just looking at that footnotes is saying, are, are they arguing for or against DER? Um, right. So I, I think yep. your point is very well taken. Um, okay, so we'll, thank we'll, you. We'll put our we'll put our uh, writing pens uh, in, in order. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Excellent. I I had um another question, but you know what? I don't know that it's of the greatest importance. So I'm going to go ahead and yield back to you, Chair. Thank you all for your your comments. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, covered a lot of ground. Got a few topics I want to talk about, but I guess as an overview, you know I. I read the filing, I looked at the presentation, I looked at the materials. So I think when we started this afternoon, I felt uncomfortable with what I saw. What I, where I stand right now is very concerned to be generous, uh, but I hope by the end of this, some of that can be repaired, but remains to be seen here. So I, I wanna first start with the transition plan. I wanna talk then talk about the existing reliability problems. Um, Cause it, there was a statement made that, uh, Bolton, you said we need to maintain reliability before and after, but the discussion here has shown that it's a serious problem this year. Um, and projects were delayed despite that problem being in place. And then we're going to talk about that delay, two year delay. Um, so there was a statement at the end of the, the conclusion of the plan. It says that. The companies believe the KPP transition plan is robust and resilient and will over time maintain reliability, lower customer bills and significantly reduce carbon emissions. So let's let's talk about the robustness and the resilience. So if we can look at the slide 17, yeah, slide 17 of your presentation, please. If me, if uh, Greg can put it up. Okay, so I think, uh, thank, thanks for putting this together. Um, Colton, I, you did a good job explaining it and just, uh, what what I look at here is, well, we're going to, in a second, we're going to talk about the near term where you already have existing violations. Um, but what we're going to talk about is, let's talk about the transition. Um, here's what I, if we look at what I call the first pillar here, and that's the first increase in resources. So what I, what I circled here, what I, what I circled around that is highly uncertain. That that pillar looks shaky to me. Look at the four projects there: Waiahu, Waiana, Ulehu, which actually very good news. The commissioners have signed off on that approval today. Uh, that order should be filed either well, I think probably tomorrow morning or possibly late this afternoon. So this is um, you know breaking news for everyone. We we're trying to do our part to move these along. So uh, that's positive. That's all um, in the works. So. That, you know, um, so that'll help meet the timeline. Um, Kamole, as you said, that was just submitted in February. You know, not a this. This is the reality of this, right? That the, the uh, project ownership shifted, and there's a delay to that. But if I look at those four, you know, one of those is on appeal. Um, one, 
It's going to be subject to more discussion based on our discussion of battery projects here. The other two, one, you know, one's going to, we've approved, still has to go forward, and, you know, one is behind. So, again, that for that, to me, that's the first pillar and it looks shaky. What happens if any, you can imagine all sorts of scenarios with all four of those, including not seeing any of them by the timeline you have K3 retire. So, what if that pillar crumbles? Um, so where it seems to me that we've set up another situation very similar to what we're facing on Oahu, where those don't come through. Um, the project that could have been filling this in in the near term all along has been delayed two years. That comes later. And then again, our backs are right up against the planned retirement. And to me, this is just a very much setting up a situation where higher probability than not to delay the retirement, which after all the years of planning is not. That's not our first contingency. We're going to talk about that later also. Um, so I, I'm sorry, your statement says that this is robust and resilient, but to me, the first pillar looks shaky. So can, can we talk about that further? That, that that's what, I mean, that's what we have here. So how do we, how do we move more pillars? <laughs> how do, again, how do, how do we make it more? We want it to be robust and resilient, but what I'm looking at is seems to me is prone to crumbling. So I I guess Colton and Scott, if we can start with with that. Well, Chair, maybe I can start and Colton, you can jump in here. But I mean, I I just want to acknowledge that's that is why we're all gathered here today, right? Um to share information, current status of all these different components of this transition plan. And, you know, going forward, really digging into each of the details of these projects and the different steps that we, that they still have to get through and be able to look forward at how do we accelerate any one or, or more of those steps. So clearly, as I think the, one of the strongest themes we wanted to relay today is that you know, we we heard loud and clear from the commission in the earlier status conferences that it's not just good enough for the company to just focus on its own parts of the of the puzzle, right? I mean, we we that's critical. Look to see how we can shave time off. Can we move things in parallel? Can we take things off the developer's plate and put it on ours? Um, so that's that's absolutely critical for us to do. Uh, but then even more so to go beyond and look to see as the developers themselves have other approvals. I mean, this is where, you know, I think it, you know, when we put in the bullet point on one of the other slides about leveraging whatever we can take away from the work that's being done under the governor's task force here on Oahu, um, that's exactly what we also need to do to apply to each of these Maui projects, right? So weeks again, will add up to months, hopefully and we can address these different projects. I mean, everything you said, uh, Chair, is, is factual. There's always gonna be risk to any one of these projects, whether it's utility owned or IPP developed or on the uh, customer DER side, there's always gonna be those risks. So, um, you know, as far as exploring additional contingencies, well, our major focus right now is just trying to get these projects done if not accelerated that that is our first push here um you know beyond that you know it is it is a matter of making sure that we're we're going to be working with others like hawaii energy the demand response side of the house what can we do to shave these peaks off and you know i think that's that's what we're that's what we're here for okay i i pre Oh, go ahead, Colton. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Chair. Just real quickly, uh, you know, some of the risks you identified, like Scott said, you know, they're they're real. These are issues we have to work through. I, I do want to add, though, on top of that, that a lot of the things that we identified and are already having conversations with the developers to accelerate their project to sort of offset or prevent uh, any further delays are not baked into these schedules yet. Uh, so things like our quicker energy uh, engineering review times, uh, faster um, pre-commercial operation testing, and all of the steps there, 
uh, those are things that uh, we've committed to are working with the developers to embed within their schedules to either move their the, the those pillars to the left uh, or if they are facing headwinds that are causing delays to offset those those delays. Okay, I I appreciate the response and what you have our commitment to work together to see these move faster also. I mean, I think we all share that. We all share the urgency. I I just again I want to point out that I mean the slide title says the plan's robust and reliable, and I'm just not ready to take that to the bank yet. And I say take to the bank because we're going to talk about this at the end. Let's be very clear about who carries the cost and the risk when these things fall apart. It's the public out there. So we need to be very cognizant of who's carrying these costs and risks. And like I said, we're we're going to talk about that. Um, but I'm I'm not ready to sign off that this is robust and reliable based on what I see and what I've heard. Uh, but we'll absolutely work with you on that because we have we share just as much interest in seeing success. Um, and we will talk about, Scott, you talk about sharing information. We are going to talk about transparency here also, because we haven't seen that yet, or we haven't seen it sufficiently. Um, so, okay. So the, the second topic I wanted to talk about was, Colton, this was a statement that you said in the, I think it was in your introduction, that we need to maintain reliability before and after. But I mean, let's look at the, per, the first part of this graph, and it's your next slide, 18. Can you, or, Either one, or actually, let's look at 18 because it highlights we've got this big dip in the middle of this year. And all I heard was the main way to address this is to defer maintenance. I mean, what kind of risk are we putting on the public that are, you know, the main that um, that's our solution set here? And, and again, I'm going to keep bringing this up. That's in the context of a project. It was supposed to be online July 2021, delayed two years. That could have been filling in in the middle here. Um, so, sure, you're this, talking about you're talking about the EES uh, Kuehilani project. Correct, correct. So, but the reality here is the the graph that we're looking at, and and we agree. And I think it was encouraging to see the additional commitment to the grid services, uh, but that's not going to be online by this summer. So, um, and your prior filings, the the temporary DG docket, you know, this has been known for years now. So, what what's the? I mean, the the main answer is that we're going to defer maintenance and you know possibly not have that as an option later. Worst case, um, what? That's the only thing I heard is the main lever to pull here. Well, Chair, I, I think that is one of the primary levers that we have to pull. And what we can do is we can provide an updated graph, which would actually show the impact of deferring that maintenance. And as we explained, we actually feel like we have some flexi flexibility to do that with certain of our uh, combustion turbines, given their, their recent overhauls. So we'll provide that updated information so you can get a better picture um, about what that option would be. Um, you know, it's this also assumes that you know it doesn't take really into account the lower loads that that we currently are experiencing. So that's the other update that we can provide in terms of uh, hopefully hopefully giving you a little bit more comfort about the 2021. Um, you know, we're we're going to continue to work as closely as we can with the uh, renewable project developers to see again how how we can accelerate projects. But you're right, we're not going to be able to move it into this summer. Um, that is unfortunate. Um, the delays to that project, uh, we feel, I mean, again, partly because of being able to adjust that project, the footprint, the design, because of community engagement. So we we supported AES in terms of their engagement with the community and making those changes. And it's unfortunate, yes, it resulted in project delays. So. Um, yeah, I think I think our biggest lever right now is to go to our scheduling of the of the unit maintenance. Okay, let's uh, talk about the third item that I was not expecting to hear, uh, but this was a comment that Mark 
Sano brought up. If we look at, um, I don't know if we have to go to it, but it's your own slide eight says so the prerequisites for KPP retirement. Uh, so again, to to even right, you have four here, um, and so if I look at that other slide, slide seventeen, if we do all those projects, what I still heard him say, it's hard to say at this point if you can meet number four. So it sounds, I mean, to me that sounds like that's again setting up. I mean, we don't even know at this point we can do all this, and then we're going to find out later that there's still other hoops to jump through. And again, it it just feels to me that's setting up. Another delay in retirement if we don't even know at this point about. What the megawatt requirement is for your 4th prerequisite. So, I mean, it's. I wasn't expecting to hear that today, but that's a concern again that we were, we're setting up the bar to move again later. Chair, maybe I can ask Mark Mark, what's your projection in terms of when we'd be able to get a better quantification of the. Grid forming services that we need, and what's our pathway? Yeah, so we, you know, we are wrapping up um, those IRS studies. So I think there's a few. I think the main thing is to to be able to tune these inverters because it's, I mean, like like we've been saying, it's it's a new technology, right? So we need to we need to get this right. So um, I think the likely outcome and recommendation from the study is to. To make sure that we can tune uh, these inverters properly, so that they, you know, they interact with each other in a way that's not detrimental to the system. And when would we have that better picture, Mark? When would we be? When would yeah? We be I think we're looking at, um, you know, towards the end of this month. Uh, it might bleed into May a little bit, but you know, we're we're wrapping up those those studies shortly. Okay, so that, that's helpful, but let's let's say if you your study comes back and says you do need to make changes, and so projects we need to, I mean, there sounds like a possibility there that that's either leading to delays in some of the projects we have on this timeline and or need for additional resources. So what that just that sounds like a a, a possible outcome from that study. So what what do you, Again, you're gonna come back to us and say we can't do this on this timeline. Is that is that the I mean to me that's the logical next step. So yeah, the you know, we don't expect any major investments at this time that we're gonna be needed. I mean, it's you know the the flip of this is that if we didn't require grid forming inverters as part of the RFP, you know, the system, what we were finding in the study, the system is unstable. So the grid farming inverters are certainly helping to stabilize the system in these conditions where you're not running any um, uh, synchronous generators. So, you know, we do think it's certainly a positive benefit there that we required grid farming inverters as part of the stage two projects. No, I, that, that's a understood and appreciated, but Mark, what I'm working with is the statement that is here at the, the conclusion of the report. It says that this plan's robust and resilient. And what you're telling me is you haven't, we haven't finished the studies to know whether that's true. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, well, you know, based on our preliminary results, we, with what we're seeing right now is that the grid forming inverters um, do a lot to stabilize the system. So we put, we required the grid forming inverters as part of our stage two RFP, correct? Mark? Yes. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. And what we're doing right now is completing studies, which will be more detailed in terms of how you tune those grid forming inverters, correct? Yes. Okay. Assuming those, those projects and the tuning get done, at this stage, we're pretty confident we will be able to acquire this sufficient grid forming capability. It's just that you couldn't answer a quantifiable uh, question that Dave asked earlier. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I know we don't have the right full answer for you, Chair today, Griff, uh, Chair Griffin. But um, when we complete these studies within the next uh, uh, within the month, we'll have much better information. So that's understood, but let's also keep. 
just keep in mind what I thought we heard was that based on the existing permitting, there's only one more year timeline you can get extension on the plant. And that and that's not the direction we're headed, but I mean that that is, you know, at that point it becomes a hard constraint and or you have to go back and ask for additional time uh work time. Um so you know we're not dealing with an infinite buffer here. Um and well we're gonna get to that topic too. But um so it seems like you know we're we're presented with this information we're presented with what we need to go out to procure and get this done and it's now april 2021 and we're being told still not sure so and again what's the what's the fallback again your first contingency plan is to further delay the retirement and there's based on the existing permits there's only one year to do that Sure. I'm, maybe you can clarify. I'm not sure what you're asked, what you're saying, but we only have a year to deal with the existing permits. Uh, can you clarify that? Oh, I, I thought that was the discussion with Bob. That was in the, um, maybe I misunderstood. Let me clarify the, that. Um, the, the permit is a five-year permit. We have to renew it again at the end of the five years. We've had to do that for the whole life of the plant. So, there's no reason for us to believe that we could not renew it again. Okay. Yeah. But that... Existing permits are in place until through the end of 2025. We, if we needed to pull that trigger, we would we would have to start working on that those permit extensions or renewals, probably in the 2024 timeframe. Or 2023. Or 2023. Well, I, just so I'm clear, the under the existing permit. It's it's uh, it's there until 2025, and your current timeline to retire the plan is 2024, right? So that's one Correct. year. Correct. That's right. Correct. If we had to, though, get a, an additional another five year extension of that permit, um, there's no reason for me to believe that we couldn't do that. Bob, the plan says it's robust and reliable. Yeah, I wasn't addressing that. I was addressing the issue of whether or not, you know, well, I'm, I'm we addressing what has been presented to us that we need to make firm decisions on and sign off on. You know, our 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 decision making is not that fungible. Yeah, Chair Griffin, you know what we're trying to explain here is that we get the urgency of moving these renewable projects and storage projects along as quickly as we can. That has been beaten into us time and time again. We get it. So that is our primary contingency. I mean, I don't even want to say that that's our contingency. But that's our plan. Now, when you talk about contingency plans, which we really hope we never have to execute, that's when you talk about, okay, in 23, where are we? Do we have to make a decision to file for, for new permits for this Kahului power plant, right? We don't want to do that. So, but yet that is a possible contingency option if we absolutely had to go down that path, which we, again, do not want to do that. So we're just trying to clarify what we think of as contingency options versus what our plan is. Um, and even on that plan, again, we get it that everything has to be done, you know, whatever we can think of, DER, grid services, accelerating the projects, working with the developers, the county, Whoever we can think of, that's what we have to do. All hands on deck. We 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 certainly we 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 get that. Okay, so I want to make sure it was clear. Uh, Commissioner Potter brought up the discussion on DER again. I read the same thing. Uh, the footnote. I think we can all agree every every generator nothing's 100% available um but decisions to call that out so if you think that or let me just offer that it would seem to um inform skepticism of the commitment to that option but there was an extended discussion of it so I won't uh, I won't reiterate it any further but, but I do want to talk about we we have talked about the existing reliability concerns. Um, we talked about the graph. I do want to talk about the one question that we asked. 
hasn't come up yet, but um, you know, it's never lost my radar that one person here on the call was without power for seven hours la end of last year. Um, so that's Leo and I's colleague. Um, and so, you know, there have been, we've continued to ask questions about what the plan is on these high wind events. People on the west side of Maui, thousands of people in resorts were without power. Um, and what I read in that response was what there was some general references to um, putting in an ADMS. What is it? What your mitigation measures are. Um, so what, there's never any discussion about when any of this is happening. And you know these are not isolated events. That same storm, there were serious reliability problems on Lanai. I believe Molokai. Actually, I believe every island. Um, and on Maui, it's been a repeated uh, occurrence with wildfire and high wind events. So, you know, as we talk about reliability broadly and particularly how these investments help it, you know, I saw no specific discussion here about how to address that. And that's one whole side of the island. Again, thousands and thousands of people. So, what, where is, can we get more insight into that, please? Chair, this is Colton. Let me let me start off and and ask others to join. So specific to the outage in December, um, that was a, a sequence of events that ultimately resulted in all three transmission lines that serve the west side um, being taken out of service. Right? It it was it was a combination of of winds uh, coupled with a fire that ultimately brought down um, all three circuits. Uh, and so so first of all, you know that's not a situation that we we want to have or have again. Uh, but it is uh, an event that resulted in in not just one, not even just two, uh, but but three lines going out. And we don't plan Maui's transmission system for the outage of three lines or to avoid outages if we have three three circuits out. Um, so the kinds of things, but that doesn't mean you don't do anything, right? So the kinds of things that where we think is going to be helpful in reducing the probability of occurrences like that happening in the future is to make sure that the condition and the shape of each of those three circuits and all of the components that make up of it, make it up, right? The breakers, the conductors, the insulators, the poles that they're on, all of that uh, are in good operating order. And that's why we focus much of our response around a program to step up our asset sustainment uh, program, which is the proactive replacement of, of in this case, uh, transmission uh, equipment. The other thing that can help um, for events like this, but not necessarily this very event, but can also help other events that are attributable to wind is oftentimes when you have high winds, the problem that it, it, it creates on the system is not permanent, it's temporary. Um, conductor spans slap into each other, a tree brushes into a conductor, things like that that's, that happens can take a circuit out, uh, but isn't a, a um, sort of continuous or permanent failure of that, of that circuit. So, we made reference to our grid modernization strategy, but it, because it includes uh, automation uh, of our system so that when we have incidences like that caused by high winds, the outage is either uh, momentary or if it's a sustained outage, it is, it is made shorter. So those are the kinds of things that we think can help when we have situations where we have a multiple series of events that occur uh, like the one uh, in, in December that affected Commissioner Potter. So I, I appreciate the additional like, explanation, Colton. I found it here. It's page three by our response, um, but there's still no timeline in here. So do you have anything more specific or definitive on that? Or is that something that could be supplemented later? Yeah, we. We can definitely supplement it, but uh, I'll share one thing. So one of the things that uh, the engineers are working on quite feverishly right now 
uh, is uh, called a RAP, uh, a rapid action plan uh, to improve uh, the reliability performance uh, on, on Maui as one example. Um, you know, that's not focused only on high wind, but just on a number of things that we can do uh, to improve the reliability, but we can augment this IR response with additional details, especially on timelines of some of the near-term efforts, including our RAP, including our asset sustainment programs uh, and things like that. I mean, I don't see any reference in this response to either of those, so, or so is that? Yeah, we, we, yeah, so we make reference in the IR response to asset sustainment or asset replacement. Uh, we we don't talk about the wrap because that's more focused on distribution, not and not focused on on high winds. But it's it's all relevant to the discussion about uh, either avoiding or reducing customer outages. Uh, perhaps we were a bit too narrow in how we responded to the IR, uh, and and for that we can we can supplement our response. Okay, no, that's appreciated. We'll follow up. I said it. We have someone here that lived through it. Um, lots and friends. I mean, well, you get the point. Um, okay, please turn. Uh, we're going to discuss the Kuhilani project. We asked. We asked what? I mean, we asked another IR following up on that. I don't have the terminology here, but we asked what the basically the the customer cost of the delay is going to be. Your answer says that customer savings or benefits are not necessarily lost from the, and sorry, just so people on the outside understand, this is a project that was approved by the commission. Uh, the original online date, the uh, GCOD was July, 2021. Um, it's been delayed until October, 2023. Uh, it was in that initial graph and we'll get into this. It was one of the largest uh, cost beneficial projects I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, so, so in my view, there's a two-year delay, and so people aren't going to see the savings in that time frame. So we asked about that to quantify it. Your answer was customer savings or benefits are not necessarily lost in the adjustment of the AES Koilani projects GCOD since the 25-year term of the PPA remains the same. Starts when AES Koilani projects achieves commercial operations. Benefits from the project will be realized over the same time frame, just from its new GCOD. So let me let me just. Or I, I want to un, just be clear that I'm understanding your interpretation of that. So what I read out of that is that, you know, it will come online two years later, but there'll be two years on the back end, and so customers are the same. That they, they'll get two more years of benefits 25 years from now instead of. I think, I think the way that you're characterizing it and your understanding it is correct, Chair. Um, it, it is factual that the customers do not receive those benefits in the years 21, 22, right? According to the original schedule, um, that's, 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 that's true. Um, but then the life of the project is 25 years from the time that it actually does come, come online, which would push it, push it two years, two years further in the future. And the characterization is the customers are the same, right? That, that's how, what I read. That's my characterization, the response. And my answer to that is that if I believe there's a time value of money, which I do believe, you know, the years 2022 and 2023 are not the same as 20, what is it, 2047 and 2048. Um, yeah. And so because we asked and we didn't get it this morning, I went to the original application and I looked at the residential bill impact. So that's attachment four. Um, you know, we, it's here, I did my own calculation. What I mean by the most cost beneficial project I've ever seen. Uh, so the, what, when you, when you applied this, when you applied for this project before us, the, the residential bill impact. So the monthly decrease in bills was the first year is estimated at. 9 dollars and 12 cents. So for 1 year, that's 110 dollars. The customer, your customers' bills would go down by $110 in 2022. 2023, your estimate was $12.22 per month. So your average residential customer on Maui 
they'd see their bills go down in that year by about $150. Uh, so we're talking about the, the two year delay here. Um, my estimate based on your calculations here is that's gonna cost average residential customers on Maui $260 each on average. Some are gonna be more, some are gonna be less. Um, so to me, that's a very real cost. If you go and poll people on Maui, you know, would you rather see your bills $260 lower? I bet a lot of them are gonna say yes. Um, and like I said, I've never seen a project that is off one single project that is offered this level of benefit over the entire lifetime. It's almost three hundred million dollars in projected savings. And so, you know, what's on paper now is we've lost that. We're going to lose it in the next two years. And you tell us we don't have to worry about it. Um, sure, now you sure, should, Griffin, I don't know, I'm, I'm not finished yet, Scott. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Now, I understand and we're going to talk about that, that, you know, the. The answer is that project needs to be reconfigured, reconfigured because of community concerns. We've asked for the discussion about that, and all of that is still filed confidentially. So we're being told that this is going to benefit the community, but we can't even share what that discussion looks like. So I'm sorry, like this is, you know, it's supposed to be public benefit, but we can't share that information with the public. We're going to delay real dollars that would be going into people's pockets. We put people to work to build the project and. You know, and, and we've kind of repeated the same answer when we look at this plant retirement that, you know, it's going to. We're forced to work to, to work to rely on that shaky pillar because this project has been delayed. So. We've got to have answers for this. So I'm sorry, I did cut you off Scott, so please. Uh, please respond. Well, Chair, I mean, we have, you're correct. We are still trying to work with AES in terms of unredacting uh, more of the details of this, of this information, which we have submitted and filed with the commission. Um, you know, we're not making this up that there were community concerns uh, about the original layout of that project. And one might say, well, could AES have forged their path forward anyway? And just said, we're going to continue on. Thank you very much community. And would that scenario have resulted in even further delays to the project or litigation? In which case, maybe the project gets delayed even further than what it currently is. So I could come up with other scenarios that could say, perhaps AES should have done just that. Um, I think it is absolutely regrettable, it's unfortunate that yes, the project is delayed. But again, um, you know, I think in this day and age, we are asking developers to spend that time up front in engaging with the community and not going to them just by saying, here's the project, I'm engaging with you and check that box. So I believe the developer did the right thing in this case in terms of listening to the community and adjusting their project and then, yes, unfortunately, that did cause further delays on ter in terms of the ultimate schedule. Um, this gets to the overall policies uh, question. You know, as we are all trying to get to 100% renewable energy as quickly as we can, but yet we are starting to see more pressures on the communities that are being asked to host these projects and infrastructure. At some point, how do we strike that correct balance? Right? I mean, I, I know the PUC, you folks are under gun just as we are to get to that 100% renewable as quickly as we can. And there's also the added benefit of lowering customer bills as we can get these good projects online. But I would be very wary of just saying, sorry, that's what the statute requires of us and just continuing to you know, go forward because I think we will see more challenges and litigation. So we are trying to strike that right balance, Chair. So I appreciate that, Scott. Um, and I don't want to be in any way construed that our position is to run over communities, not listen to community concerns. Um, it is partly why we asked for the emails to understand to understand what that discussion was, understand what it was internally, and all we've received so far. Well, we have two here. The rest of the emails all look like this. 
So let me just uh, we, we as, as far as in the email itself, the only ones that you've actually left open to the public. Um, first email, January 7th of this year, 2021. So all this has gone on, you know, first the first discussion of the timing is in January of this year. We've held two sure. Spanish conferences with you already. Let okay. me let me ask if uh, maybe Duke uh, Oishi can can share a little bit more light in terms of the nature of our discussions with AES about being able to provide sure more Please transparency. Sure, chair. Um, I think it's Scott had uh, explained touch this on the in the beginning of our conference call, but um, you know we have uh, obligations to AES under a non disclosure agreement. And, um, you know, we tried our best to meet the time frame and file responses to the information request, uh, but providing correspondence and we were coordinating with AES, but, you know, fortunately, due to timing constraints, they said that they did not have enough time to be able to indicate what's specifically covered under the NDA and, and what could be disclosed publicly. So, um, we did the best we could and, um, you know, as Caroline noted, you know, we appreciate the additional time. We're going to ease out time to work with AES to provide uh, more information as much as we can. We'll keep we'll keep trying to press. We'll keep pressing on this uh, chair. Uh, no, I appreciate. And we'll keep pressing. I'll, I'll just. Do you know your your obligations to the developers of the NDAs? I, I would just highlight we have obligations to the public to address that near term liability problem and try and address the two year delay in savings that we're going to get. So at some point, like it has to come out. Um, okay. So that's gotten, do you understand what our concerns are with this? Um, so I want to, bring this to conclusion in a couple of ways. One, clearly heard our concerns about the transparency here, but I do want to bring up two other topics and it, it's a um, very, it's a take off of a comment that Colton made when we had a discussion last month. And the, the, um, the discussion was about owning responsibility for what's happened here. Um, so I want to talk about a couple concepts, and it, it is a based on what I just talked about before. That there's a very real concern that each one of these delays, um, the very real possibility that we're going to have to further delay the retirement of this plan. Right now, it's customers bearing all of that cost and risk. Correct. I mean, there's customers are going to pay the higher electricity bills because of the delay in the project. We have to go and keep the plant online longer. You know, it's not lost on me. I, I was here when we wrote, issued the Maui rate case order, I think in 2013, and we did a deep dive on the cost of keeping that Kahului plant online. It was a very expensive unit to keep online. Um, so if that needs to stay online, you know, again, the public will be asked to bear that cost. So is that, are we, do we have this? Well, is that your understanding the same as mine, Scott? Well, it's the cost of running the system, Chair. So, um, and that that is borne by our our customers. Okay, but these decisions are made by the company, um, and they have real costs that the public is bearing now. So, there, there, in my opinion, there needs to be a rebalancing of this cost and risk equation. If these are the results that we're going to see, if you're expecting, we're going to continue to see this when the expectation is 100% on customers' backs. That, I mean, are we on the different wavelengths here? Chair, I think I would respond by saying this. I think as we are moving forward, we are faced with many decisions on a daily basis, uh, including with our working with our developers. Um, we are making decisions about, um, you know, balancing reliability uh, requirements to to hook up new projects, um, balancing that with the cost of running our system. To us, what we're always very mindful of is the cost to our customers. 
you know, when our customers are, are not able to receive benefits from an attractive renewable project, we recognize that is not a good thing. Um, what we look at in terms of our portfolio of projects that we're trying to get online is that we see the benefits that would be brought to our customers. But, uh, you know, take the Kuehelani Kue project again as an example. AES comes to us and they say, hey, look, we want to change the configuration of this project because we think that this is the right thing to do in terms of uh, responding to the uh, community concerns. And, you know, our configuration is required to make us, you know, to keep the project viable. And so, you know, that's another decision point. What we do our best to do is balance all the considerations that come to us and you know, in that case, we made the decision to to work with AES and support that reconfiguration. Um, ultimately, you folks are our regulators, and you folks will be looking at whether or not our decisions and our pathways are prudent and in the best interests of of customers and and the public public interest. Um, so we fully recognize that that is that is your folks' role and job. Um, we're going to continue to try and do our best to again balance all the needs of our customers, our community, the developers. Um, get off of get off of fossil fuels as soon as we can. Drive the bills down. I mean, that's our that's our job. It's 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 clear. It's it's in statute. Um, and your folks' job is to continue to look at to see whether or not we've made pr the prudent decisions. And uh, you know, we'll do our best to try and show to you folks that we've made the right choices. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, I I would like to think that. You know, we we have our our case. Uh, we have our chance to make that fair case to you folks, and uh, you folks will consider all all the things that we had to uh, you know, you know, consider as we made our choices. Well, that's appreciated. Uh, I think we have asked those questions, and in cases like when we asked for the internal discussions, you know, the information is not being provided. When we've asked in the past, we got a similar answer on the cost that. You know, two years in 2047, 2048, 2048, they're no different than 2022, 2023. We totally understand, appreciate community concerns. Scott, it's not lost on me. We've had protests right the very place that we're sitting here. Um, so it's been very front and present for the commission here, but we too need to balance all these and, and stay mindful. Um, that chart, those first two years and the graph that we're talking about here is very concerning. Folks on Maui are going to bear that reliability risk until these projects come online um, and the cost. So we're going to talk about a couple options that the commission is going to be considering. We'll get your feedback on it here. So one, you know, it seems to me, again, I, I keep bringing up the timeline and for the plant retirement. And I, like I said, everything I've heard so far makes me sound like it's there's going to be an ask later that it needs to be delayed. Um, so I think what the commission is going to want to consider is something we brought up last week is we can separate the physical from the financial here. Um, commission can financially retire this plan. We pick a date that goes off the books. If you make decisions that require it to be online longer, then shareholders are going to bear some of that risk. Is that something we can talk about? Well, we'd have to see what they're what you specifically propose, Chair. But um, I think that again, we would fall back on, you know, whether we believe we've made the right decisions, and we may end up disagreeing with you folks on certain of those. Um, in which case, we'll we'll um, you know work through the process with you folks as uh, as best we can. That's understood. But I just want to give the context. Right now, what we're being told is that everything we've been presented looks like it's robust and resilient. So based on the current information and our concerns, you know, this is the path we look we look like we need to take to put a firmer line in the sand and drive well, decisions towards meeting that instead of just, you know, saying, well, you know, we'll just go ask DOH for another extension. We'll just kind of keep uh, delaying. So it's understood. Well, so sure. the, the, com the company has this due process to this as well, and we're, we'll work correct. through that. Yes, correct. Look okay. forward to that. Second, second topic again has to deal with the cost and the risk of the delays to projects. Um, so what we've talked about, what would the commission like to do 
uh, very soon to set up regulatory accounting uh, for these projects based on the original GCODs. And those accounts would track um, all the savings that are going to be lost due to the delays. And so for the 99% of people outside of here who don't understand the regulatory jargon, you know, these are accounts that track, uh, One Electric has these for the cost of their COVID related costs. Um, these are set up to track certain uh, types of costs and there's later determinations made on the, the pathways for recovery of those. So we have these uh, right now for your accounts related to COVID related costs. Uh, it's been used in the past with tax reform. And what we'd like to set up here are to set up these accounts that track those delayed savings. Uh, there'd be a future discussion about how those are dealt with um, at the right time and place. But the the actual the process of setting up those accounts will do a few things. One, it will it will provide greater transparency on you know what those potential loss savings are. Two, it does uh, give a strong incentive for the companies to bring projects online sooner. Sooner the projects are online, the sooner the account is closed out. Um, so, okay, do you have any feedback on that, Scott? Um, Chair, I mean, if um, if we are asked or required to set up those accounts and track uh, uh, quantify delayed savings, then we'll we'll do that. I mean, I, as you say, the actual decision point later on about what what to do with those ac accounts. Uh, I mean, that's when we would, you know, hopefully be able to get into a a um, you know more detailed discussion with you folks and you know get into the very topics that we're we've been talking about this afternoon. Do you agree that it'll uh, provide strong in incentive, basically for all of us to work together to bring projects online? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll we'll look forward to further discussion on that. Um, appreciate the work and the time that the team has put in. Um, you do have our full commitment on working together to bring these projects online. I don't think there's there's been any daylight between all the parties that have talked about this. Um, so we'll continue that work on the task force as well as on the other islands. Um, so any, I guess I wanna offer, Scott, any other comments you wanna offer in closing for the companies? Well, Chair, uh, Commissioners, I just wanna express our, again, our, our full commitment. Um, just like you said, the PUC is firmly committed and there's no light between us uh, as well as the parties to get these projects done uh, on time and and uh, even sooner, right? There's so many benefits in terms of the renewable energy value, in terms of savings for customers, uh, in terms of allowing us to retire the old fossil fossil units uh, in a, in a reliable manner. So there's there there's no reason why any of us would want to extend you know, operation of, uh, you know, frankly, the, some very aging fossil fuel based power plants. So I want to just again, reiterate our, our willingness, our commitment to, to doing this, to getting things on track to, to executing. Um, you have our commitment that we will do an all hands on deck approach to this. Um, you know, I would uh, expect that we will have lots more information to be able to share with you folks as we, uh, Again, have to navigate through the vagaries sometimes of non disclosure agreements and such. Uh, but I think you folks by this very WebEx have made it clear to the outside world how, how clearly important that is um, for the commission to be able to do its job. So we'll continue to also work with the developers as uh, closely as we can uh, on transparency. And, um, you know, like you said, I think I think we're all in this together and. Um, you know, hopefully uh, we, we can we can be celebrating uh, within the next year for for more project successes. Thanks, Scott. Um, I do want to close on a positive note as well. Um, and this one is more broadly in, you know, in the past month, we've asked for feedback from lots of parties, those directly involved, and, and we've seen things come in from all over the place. So we want to thank everyone who's taking the time to offer those contributions. 
um, on multiple islands now because we see, you know, certainly how the work on Oahu is going to directly inform the work here on Maui. So we'll look forward to continuing that in the, the discrete different projects ideas. Um, we started this discussion about with, with the dis, uh, further discussions with Clearway, you know, they've stepped up and tried to find ways to address some of the needs here. So we look forward to continuing with all the different parties that bring the ideas forward, uh, as well as working with State Energy Office and Juan Electric and being successful on all the islands here. So with that, I'm gonna bring things to a close. Thank everyone for their time. Appreciate it. You know, we've run on far longer, but it's been a, a worthwhile discussion today. So thanks everyone. And we'll continue to progress with this. Aloha. Thank, thank you. Thank you.